is this being streamed on Twitch? What's going on here? We are live on Twitch, ladies and gentlemen. I have now sided with Alexander Bromley, a.k.a. Alex Bromley, two bald-bearded men against two pencil nerds. You guys suck, both you and Dr. Wolf. This is the Balkan conflict, Milos. Let's get ready. Hey, I'm ready anytime, anywhere. Both Greek. Actually, neither of them look Greek. Pac is a ginger bit. Uh, it does not look Greek. And they're basically twins, and therefore, <laughs> by extension, Alex does not look Greek either. Yeah, very yeah. nice. It it is funny that 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 I agree with. I will say that with your beard, you're looking everything. To me, you do look the most Greek. But look, they wanted the best. They're not going to make it. Blaha's not going to be here. I'm going to be here. We're going to have this conversation all about exercise oh, no. science and these pencil necks, Alex, that are just ruining the space. You made this incendiary video, okay? Just calling them lame, stupid, weak, small. Um, it got a lot of attention, but I do want to have this conversation. I think it's a very important conversation. I think those that are unfamiliar, the two resources prior maybe to listening to this, watching this, should be your video in the first place. And then also, Dr. Milo Wolf, his maybe response down below, just, just to get a general feel of what we're talking about. But it's a fascinating topic that has kind of been mulled over in a variety of different ways. But I think you did eloquently put together a video essay of which we're here to talk about. So first, maybe let's do just some general introductions of everyone, and then we'll kickstart, uh, Alex, with that video, your general outline, and go from there. So uh, Alex, can you just give a little introduction, man? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Alex Bromley. I uh, am a professional YouTuber, which I never thought that I would say. Um, I have about 20 years coming up on 20 years experience in strongman. Uh, I've competed at the world level. I ran a strongman gym for a while. Uh, I have some education, although I'm not going to get into the weeds on that. Um, uh, but yeah, I decided to take everything and put it into a channel to try to dissect some of the things I struggled with and that I know a lot of other people struggle with, with regards to strength uh, on that topic is uh, the topic of how science plays a role. And that's what led me to, to make this video. So here we are today. Fantastic. Milo, introduce yourself. Right. Less experience at the world stage, unfortunately, but also some education in sports science. So been lifting for about 10 years. I've coached a few more people. Uh, recently got my PhD, so now real doctor alongside real doctor pack um, on range of motion and hypertrophy. So something pretty relevant, I'd say, to this discussion, you know, getting my PhD in sports science, specifically with regards to muscle growth and how science can inform our pursuit of strength and hypertrophy. So that's my point of view and general perspective when it comes to this debate. Perfect. And then pack, Patrick Close. So I've also been lifting for close to like 13 years now. Um, dabbled in powerlifting a bit when I was younger. Nothing too crazy though. I am a recreational lifter at the moment with uh, a similar academic background to Dr. Milo Wolf, highlighting the doctor part, real doctor, not a physician. Um, Google the paper, whom should we call doctors? It's there on PubMed if you're mad. But joking aside, um, I've also coached. Um, so I'm a full-time coach. Worked with um, hundreds of individuals from competitive powerlifters, strong men, strong women, to your, your average Joe. And my PhD was specifically on the minimum uh, minimum effective training dose required to increase one repetition maximum strength in powerlifters specifically. And um, yeah, that's me. Three very powerful channels now on YouTube. I might be, I'm the moderator. I'm maintaining a neutral position but I might have to shift an allegiance over to Alex because I'm also a professional YouTuber. So I, I don't know that, that ivory tower, we're going to get into it, but maybe let's kick it right off then uh, Alex about your video. And maybe if you could give a general outline of your points and then I'll have Milo and pack respond to them. Just the, the flow, because we have the title, fantastic title. That's how I know you're professional. Um, but then it is over 30 minutes long and there are several points you bring up. So if you had to give kind of a, a brief summary or let's say an outline because you did note before the call that some people watched the video and maybe they didn't watch it all the way but there was maybe a little confusion this is your opportunity man just to state the case of what you're thinking clearly to the audience sure the whole video was um basically an attempt to get into uh what the state of exercise science is uh what some of the misconceptions consumers have around it and 
what ultimately it can inform, if it can inform anything about what the average person needs to do in order to uh, improve themselves consistently over time, especially if you're talking about applying it to where the stakes are the highest, which would be the world stage, the Olympics, elite bodybuilding, elite powerlifting and, and professional sports and so on. So uh, the primary outline of the video was just pointing out some of the flaws in research. And again, there was an emphasis on what the consumer probably doesn't know. There was a misconception, I think, that I was like making this for the benefit of researchers or PhDs. Like I was some disgruntled homeless QAnon guy that was like doing curls in an alley and then started you know, yelling about how you can't trust the science. Um, and then I just went and started throwing rocks at a university and calling PhDs idiots. Uh, all of the things that I sourced for the video uh, come from in-house. So I cited heavily uh, a lot of the guys in the field. I pulled from the replication crisis that exists in other fields that has really kind of cast a shadow on academia. It's caused a lot of problems. Some of the fields have had to outright reinvent the way that they do uh, research and the way they handle these incentives. And that wasn't to say, hey, this is so stupid. Why are, why are any of you wasting time with this? I think the field absolutely has some things to uh, to offer. But I think in order to get to any of that, you have to be very careful about how you go about it. You have to be very skeptical. And uh, you can't assume that the way things are done is going to, at the end of the day, lead to the type of conclusions you want. So basically, the point of this was to fill the consumer who is forever being sold things based on you know this being organic, non-GMO, scientific, whatever it might be. It very often gets used as kind of a marketing gimmick. And uh, scientific literacy, and this sounds like an insult, but it's not. I'm I'm not literate in Greek. Uh, you have to go to college. You have to learn a bunch of things about uh, the way to interpret statistics and evaluate how these models are put together. And the average consumer doesn't really have that. So I feel like there's uh, a lot of people who are at a disadvantage, who are inclined to take away the wrong things, who are inclined to hyper-focus on things that uh, might seem significant and might seem like they're scientific, but might ultimately pull them away from the really important things in their training. And that's overall what the video set out to do. So real quick, Alex, would you say one of the potential issues is not with exercise science itself, but the interpretation by the consumer and the inability then to perceive some of the knowledge that's out there or what's trying to be distilled? Do you think there is a gap between the two? Is that one of the issues? Uh, I think there's a gap, but I think a lot of that has to fall at the feet of the people in the field and the communicators who are responsible for making this stuff digestible for the consumer. I think that uh, it's known in any field, no matter what you're doing, that there is a market, there's a direct incentive, and wherever there's an incentive, there's potential for bias, especially when it's a financial one. And you can draw parallels very closely to what like psychology went through. Like I took shots at a lot of fields for things that are pretty well established about the problems that they deal with and how it's different from how I think the lay person interprets science, which is they think a guy in a lab figuring out the fundamental laws of the universe. And a lot of fields, you don't quite have your hands in the gears that way. I'm about to finish my uh, bachelor's in psychology. I decided after all these years to go back, like, hey, maybe I want to teach at some point when I'm done making videos for the YouTubes. But um, my father was a psychiatrist. So it, we're very close to kind of this field. Uh, me and my wife have worked in mental health. Pop psychology is an absolute shit show. And nobody in the field will deny that fact. The replication crisis is embarrassing. We just had this thing with Francesca Gino not that long ago getting uh, sold out. And even regardless of moving stuff around, the types of research they did, when you look at it and you're like, what possible purpose does any of this serve in the real world? And there's, there's very little of it. But because there's an industry, because there's magazines and headlines and books and lectures and TED Talks to be given... There's an incentive for people to put out uh, research that isn't really relevant or isn't thoroughly vetted. And if left unchecked, like it was for so long, that can lead to a really big problem. So, um, yeah, the, the consumer needs to be able to interpret it, but we're not going to hold our breath for consumers to be able to read research and make sense of it for themselves or do the statistical analysis or figure it out, uh, figure out effect size um, or look for signs of like, fraudulent data? Of course not. So it really does have to be for the people that engage directly with this stuff, I think, to remind them of the limitations, but also remind them of the other stuff. You know, we don't find everything we know about the universe in uh, in a laboratory setting or in, in a, a double-blinded study, no matter how much we want that to be the case. So uh, yeah, balancing out the fundamental things that are required for training, to me, that's the biggest thing. And that's 
what all of my content's been about. So that's where I like to redirect people. Alex, that is a very interesting premise. When you said it is, it falls mm -hmm. at the hands of communicators, science communicators to educate the consumers. If only we were to have a round table discussion with maybe a couple hunks discussing this issue, maybe some new channels with some PhDs, who knows? So let's kick it off. Uh, maybe Milo, is there anything that you want to respond to first and then we'll go to PAC and then we'll go back uh, to Alex because I think I think that's a, a good initial setup. Your video was quite in depth and we will get into all the different points and then branch out from there. But uh, Milo, do you want to kick things off? First off, I think Alex did a tremendous job summarizing his video and clarifying some of the finer points. I think that on that balance, the video is probably a slight positive. And the reason for that is I think you did a good job with representing some of the limitations of science as it currently stands, but especially of how it's been done for quite a while. The issue I take with uh, the video as a complete sort of uh, package, let's put it that way, is that I think it ultimately represents only one side of the coin. I think it ultimately points out a lot of the limitations of science but doesn't point out how science has been working to improve upon essentially all the limitations that you mentioned in some capacity and how much of the more recent research has in fact addressed a lot of the, fact that, a lot of the stuff that was mentioned in the video. So I think it's useful for consumers of information to know ex like everything pretty much that you mentioned in the video, right? Like when it comes to the replication crisis, when it comes to studies being potentially underpowered, there was a lot of stuff that was true in there for sure, right? And that's why I think it's a net positive. The issue that for me arose was simply the fact that it was kind of just one side of the coin, ultimately. Like there's there's been many movements and initiatives that have started in the last couple decades trying to address many of these issues. And it would also be wrong to say that many of these issues aren't already addressed through the fact that on many topics, for example, different labs conduct studies on the same topic with similar designs. And if there's a consistency within these findings, yes, it's not the exact same thing as a replication, for example, but it is going to lend some credibility to an overall overarching principle, right? For example, if you consistently find that higher volumes show more hypertrophy, and we see this in a variety of labs, maybe they didn't specifically perform replication studies aiming to perform the exact same study over and over again with increasing, um, increasingly large sample sizes but it still can overall provide more confidence in the finding. So while I do agree with some of the limitations, I think there sometimes uh, your interpretation thereof or your presentation thereof might have not been perfectly charitable. The mm -hmm. thing I'll quickly say uh, besides that on taking issue with science being used as a marketing term is that I agree. I think there is an issue when science is merely used as a means to market an approach or essentially financially win off of it. The thing I would rebuke, however, is that on the flip side of that, of science being used as a marketing tool, you have people making claims that are not based on any science, right? And if we are to reject science as our best tool, not a broken tool, and I think some people might have come away from the video with that idea, not a broken tool, but still our best tool to arrive at what is the truth, then that leaves us much more susceptible and vulnerable to marketing claims made by people with less even of a scientific basis. At least with scientific claims, we do have studies coming out you know, on many topics several times a year that do quickly rectify the, or sort of change the record for the better, or rectify the record if there was a fallacious claim being made. Whereas with claims made by many gurus in the industry, right, you don't have that ability. Or at the very least, if they don't cite research, or if they are talking about speculative topics, we're just not able to dispel that fallacious marketing. And so I think it is an issue with science, let's call it science-based lifting specifically, but it's even more of an issue by far, I think, for overall lifting, specifically supplementation, but even training nowadays a little bit with some programs being solved that might not actually have much merit. The final thing I'll say is many, there is absolutely merit in combining and marrying practice and the evidence when it comes to informing how you program for lifters. Because for many topics, we don't have perfect research, right? We have some research that is somewhat relevant and we have to make that translate into who we coach and how we coach them. 
but we also have some practical experience, and that is absolutely valuable. However, the issue comes when we only or predominantly rely on just practical experience, because as much as science has its limitations, the use of uncontrolled anecdote has potentially even more meaningful limitations. And so that's where science comes in by providing a means of providing inferences based on at least relatively controlled and relatively relevant data sets. So that's kind of where I'm coming at this topic from. Um, but as I said, I think on net balance, the video is probably for the better because some of these issues do widely go undescribed and unannounced. And so the average person in the industry just doesn't really have a good idea of this stuff. And I think your video at least informed them of this. And ultimately, look, this is not a sexy topic. So you did a good job with making it at least a little bit marketable. It's my middle name. <laughs> Alex, I will say this. So, uh, Pac, do you want to speak? And then, Alex, I am uh, very aware, acutely aware of the fact that we have two people, uh, two doctors here talking. And then Alex also talk. I want to make sure, Alex, you have the time, though. So I'm going to make sure they have ample time, man, to talk. Pack, is there something you want to say before I give it over uh, to Alex? And I want uh, you obviously have a, a lot of time to just go right yeah. into it, man. Yeah, I want to just slightly open up a parenthesis and touch on the on the fact that we, as scientists and as truly science based uh, practitioners, are the ones that are or should be, but we are the ones that are aware of the limitations of science more than than everybody else, and not just sports science, but Science as a whole. And the, the one thing that I thought was a bit of an issue with, uh, with your video specifically is that exercise science was sort of highlighted as a science where there would be incentive for more uh, bias or fraud or like sloppy science to occur. When in reality, um, the incentives in even the medical science uh, and science like even neuroscience, economics, evolutionary, biology and ecology, a bunch of other sciences, we have documented examples of uh, fraud and bias that has led to people, one, dying, for example, if we look at <clears throat> uh, Mike Chiarini, the, the surgeon who was... Uh, who essentially came up with a trachea transplant technique and he was appointed at the Nobel, uh, the, the, the house of the Nobel in physiology hospital in Sweden, the Karolinska Institute. So he essentially frauded some data. Um, the, the gist of it was that you would coat a transplant um, in, in certain cells and the body would welcome it. That's the gist of it. I'm not a surgeon. Uh, and as a result of it, even though his studies were published in the best uh, journals in the world, um, they did not... Uh, note that the people that got these operations then died and we have plenty of other um, plenty of other fields like neuroscience where we you know there was a, a 10 percent sort of replication rate in, in some topics same with economics and so on and so forth and sports science specifically and a lot of the big names in sports science unbeknownst to the the average individual are not really directly benefiting much from publishing studies, especially those who are tenured and those who are already established in their in their career. There's no there's no funding. There's not many people in academia uh, care about the stuff that we look into, especially when it comes to physique and strength sports and optimizing muscle hypertrophy for the average uh, gym goer. It's mostly our eco chamber that cares. There's not much money and success that comes with it. Uh, but in other fields, and again, medical science, um, things are much, much more, uh, much greater in terms of actual financial incentives. Other than that, I echo Milo uh, in the sense to, to say that you did identify a lot of the limitations of science. But the conclusion of the video, which was along the lines of, hey, just figure out what works for you, um, sort of presents two, two sides when in reality... It's not just find out what works for you or do what the conclusion of a, a study says or an abstract, but rather see what the totality of evidence says, what works for you, and then apply that. And we see that in, like, if we actually look at the conclusions of papers, the infamous or rather famous meta-analysis by Schoenfeld et al., which has been scrutinized and has been called all sorts of names, and you had certain individuals there that hated on it, if we actually read the full paper, um, the conclusion says that 
although there is certainly a threshold for volume beyond which hypertrophic adaptations plateau and perhaps even regress due to overtraining, current research isn't sufficient to determine the upper limits of this dose post relationship. And then it concludes with, it is clear that the optimal RT dose will ultimately vary between individuals and these differences may have a genetic component. Consistent with an evidence-based approach, practitioners should carefully monitor client progression and adjust training dosages based on the individual's response versus this sort of straw man where scientists are telling people, hey, you should do all these sets, otherwise you will see no gains. And as Eric Helms had uh, put it, uh, science is more like a like a torch. Let's say you're like in a, in a dark maze and it's showing you it's allowing you to see somewhat in front of you but it's not showing you a clear way and you can use science to navigate yourself through that maze while obviously also using experience which in the analogy would be i don't know your sense senses and uh, you know touching things and just hearing things and uh, navigate versus solely relying on the conclusions of a of a study but um yeah that's me alex right before you kick off i want to say the eric helms is um that's appropriate here. I believe he said in a podcast episode that science isn't here to teach you. A research paper isn't here to teach you how to train on a Tuesday. But uh, but kick it off. Alex, take your time, man. Please. I'm, oh, I'm very I, I got. I'm running out of paper. I got a lot to respond to. I'm going to try my best to get everything uh, point by point because uh, th those are all great ideas, and I want to be able to engage with each one without leaving anything behind. Um, especially, I like. I, I just watched uh, something with Eric Helms recently, and I've digested a lot of his content and others. Uh, and there's a bunch about the way he presents uh, that I think either of us could probably pull into our argument a little bit, depending. But um, I'm going to save that for last and try and go in order. So the first thing uh, Milo talked about, um, the one sidedness of the video. And this is something that you kind of struggle with when you see the pendulum swing too far. And I think this is a a normal feature you can't really get away from whenever you're engaged in activism or if you think that there's something that's kind of going unchecked and you want to check it. Um, there is an important difference between defining exactly what you think is true versus saying like you're too far and trying to pull it back. And that's why we kind of have this eternal pendulum swing in things like politics and, uh, and, and social topics and so on. So uh, I can accept that I probably didn't do a great enough job of, of putting together what I think is like the completely combined theory of how all this fits together. However, at the end of all of this, like I'm going to say my, my view of how this potentially can insert directly into somebody's training is still probably a bit more bearish. But um, yeah, I mean, I saw a problem, so I was going after it. So uh, things are inevitably going to be one sided, but that's why we have conversations like this, because the more we flesh it out, the more resolution we can add. Um, let's see, we talked about um, replication. So like, uh, that was one thing I mentioned with the problems with these other fields. Uh, that was a small part. And I probably spent too much time on it in the video as well, because I did want to educate people, the consumers, uh, as to the actual limitations, but the limitations go way beyond just replication. And I think I had alluded to this earlier. And at some point later, after I've addressed all these questions, I'd like to get into that because I have not just concerns about the best case scenario, but I think I have some kind of relevant ideas for ways that you might be able to improve because in no way, shape or form, am I suggesting that, that bro, whether you want to call it bro science or experience or anecdote or whatever, it's like, you know, do I credit you for something or do I blame you? It's the same thing, positive, negative anecdote, or sorry, positive, negative connotation. Um, in no way am I saying that like things are just fine. Like people figure it out and they're good. Like there's problems, guys. There are problems, trust me. And that's why I made a channel because those problems ate away at years of my progress. I have scar tissue from those problems. So I'm eager to talk about those and uh, things that, uh, the ways that things can increase uh, and improve. Uh, things don't just happen in a laboratory setting, right? It, you guys are talking about this marrying of different things. And I'm always going back to the consumer because it, 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 it isn't a straw man, like Pac said, because I'm not accusing the researchers or the PhDs, or at least many of them. There's going to be people who are guilty of this all over the board, but I'm not accusing the field of being guilty of this so much as I'm trying to point out the fact that this is how it gets interpreted. And I've heard all of the, the videos about how um, you go over these studies, you lay out your case, and then at the end, you speak very carefully about what it means and what it doesn't mean. At the end of every Jeff Nipper, uh, Nippard video, and I give Nippard a hard time. I, I genuinely like Nippard, uh, but I just take issues with the way he engages with uh, these types of topics. Um, at the end, it's always like, you got to do what works for you. Things vary. Schoenfeld is, and Helms and Krieger. These are all guys I quoted. They're very, very clear about the limitations of this stuff. 
it doesn't matter because to the consumer, they see science and it goes in one ear and out the other to the point where they know they're, they're here. They're supposed to change things according to their needs and their individual variants. They didn't get any tools to do that from the thing that they're watching. In addition to that, uh, they will stick. They're likely to stick to the recommendations they heard because they think they'll be betraying what is optimal. And then I can get into what even optimal means as we talk about more complex uh, iterations of, of training as you develop uh, programs and you carry them on over time. Um, we talked about like claims without science. This is a tricky one because formal academic science isn't the only thing that causes uh, things to improve. And it's not just this is what we did back in the day before colleges. We still do this in many fields. Uh, I use martial arts as an example and fight sciences as an example, because they're not getting strategies for fighting directly from um, peer reviewed research. When you have a massive group of people that are running through a simulation over and over and over and over, and there is a firm selection barrier, what you end up getting is preservation of consequential information and consequential information diffuses through society. So before a university ever existed, we knew how to predict uh, the weather or predict seasons. We had almanacs, we built pyramids, we made inventions, and that's still going on to this day. And I would cite training as something that is still in that realm where if we can capitalize the right way in order to select for the right answer, we can do potentially big things. I'm just skeptical as to whether or not it's going to go on in a laboratory setting. The average person, I talked about scientific literacy, sees science in kind of a, a, a one-dimensional way, kind of a childlike way, because it kind of an aspect of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is ironic because that's another casualty of the replication crisis. But the way people think about um knowing just enough, knowing just enough to think you know more than you actually do. The average person hears science and they think, well, I have tasty food and a smartphone and I can get on an airplane. And that's better than doing superstitious nonsense where I'm rolling chicken bones on my front porch, trying to guess if there's going to be a tornado tomorrow. But obviously there's so much more resolution about uh, what is and what is not. And most people will dramatically underestimate what is required not what you can get away with, but what is required as far as experience determining your outcomes uh, and how you predict your outcomes uh, and probably overestimating what an individual study, even though you guys know, a lot of consumers will overestimate what an individual study is even capable of saying about their training. Um, geez, I'm, I'm starting to forget what all these notes even meant. I'm, <laughs> I'm going down a rabbit hole. Um, let me just get to the last couple. Uh, Pack brought up um, uh, the other... Um, the other fields, and this is also something I got pushed back on because it did seem like I was singling out certain fields or like misrepresenting uh, the benefit one field has versus another. Um, there's a little bit of a gap here because on one, the one hand, I talked about hard and soft sciences, just solely talk about predictive power. When you have constituents of physics, you have like engineering and chemistry and, this, and so on, um, you have insane predictive power. You come up with models that give the right answer 10 out of 10 times. It's the only reason you put your child on an airplane filled with jet fuel, take it 30,000 feet in the air and land it on the other side of the country because you know that's actually safer than getting in the car and getting on the freeway. Um, as you get away from that and you have more complexity, and most of the complexity has to do with the human organism. Yes, we're we're still given to the laws of, of, of physics, but um, you have so much complexity you're trying to talk about changes the way you have to talk about it. Uh, a lot of the examples of like the replication crisis, you're right. It wasn't just psychology. Uh, cancer research was horrible. It was to the point where the pharmaceutical companies who are actually the ones causing the bias because they're selecting what gets studied for, creating the incentive to show certain types of reactions, but not others. The pharmaceutical companies were like, guys, we can't build off of anything that's coming out of your field like the pharmaceutical companies were worried about their bottom line because things went off the rails. So medical science is a problem. Yeah, it's based in physics and chemistry and biology and everything else, but you're dealing with complexity. Uh, and that's the big thing. The complexity hinders your ability to make firm conclusions. And it's also very easy to focus on small things where you lose the forest from the trees, when in reality, you have to have this huge holistic uh, idea of how an organism works. And it's very difficult to do once you add in all the confounding variables. Um, we went down to, to the straw man. I addressed that already. Uh, and, and I'll finish with, uh, there was a mention of Eric Helms. Um, one of the reasons I have a lot of respect for a lot of these guys is because the more you listen to them, the more you will hear them be very careful about how they say what we can and can't know. And it's to a point where, um, like I've heard Milo say, uh, and I think you put it in your last Instagram post, you think exercise science is the best thing we have to inform your training. 
And I actually think that if we pressed a lot of the PhDs in this field, a lot of them probably wouldn't even commit to that. When you hear Schoenfeld talk about the three-prong ap approach that was derived from medical sciences with the problem it was having with this crisis, you have individual experience, you have individual uh, variability from your clients, and then you have the evidence. But when you look at what the evidence can or can't say uh, with regards to what an individual does, it's less of a leg of a chair and it's more like a nub. And that's the thing that I worry about. And Eric Helms, in an interview we did like six uh, six months ago with Kasim from N1, um, Kasim uh, had asked him, um, what is evidence-based coaching even mean? Kasim was like, I don't think I can write a program that's evidence-based because there isn't enough information in any one piece of evidence to say, this is what goes in this program. And this is something the consumer has no idea. When you're writing a program, they're inclined to think everything you put on that paper can be substantiated with research. And the truth is most of it uh, is either arbitrary, it's stuff that's been done in the field for five decades, um, or it's stuff where, okay, you're the guy with the PhD, you think it's this way, but in reality, you're taking three, four, five steps. And I, I mentioned to PAC the other day when we were messaging, Israel Tell very recently uh, got into an argument with Fuad and you know he was a little toasty. He, had, uh, he was a little inebriated when he did this, but he was going hard in the paint that Ronnie Coleman's legs would have been bigger if he just squatted a few inches deeper. And I think there's a lot of people that would see that type of claim as being ridiculous on his face. I really like Israel. He's usually extremely measured in everything he says. I think that's just what happens when you sell t-shirts that say team full range of motion, where you end up having to commit to things to kind of a ridiculous degree. And that's the type of thing that I'm worried about. I'll take a I'll take a breath. I got lightheaded. Well, Alex, I, I want to kick it over to Milo. I just want to say quickly, thank you for making perhaps the least sexy topic interesting to the masses because your video got over a hundred thousand views. I think this is a very interesting topic. I'm surprised we're even here in the first place talking about it. Milo, maybe I don't know if you want to reverse your way back from the last point or whatever you want, but kick it over to you first. I want to give Parker a chance to speak because I, I went first last time. Sure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I just want to touch briefly on the on whether designing a program can be evidence based. So if we the true definition of evidence based is scientific literature, scientific evidence, experience and client preferences. But we're all coaches here. I mean, maybe Omar excluded. Omar is also a fellow lifter. But if we are, let's say we interview a new client for who wants to gain muscle just just muscle, let's say, we have certain variables that we need to take in consideration. Exercise technique, which will have tempo and range of motion as its components, uh, training volume, training frequency, exercise selection, and I think that's, that's more or less it. Do you not think that based on the current scientific evidence, we can have a solid base for what on average works for these things and then using the current scientific evidence adjust that to the preference of individual for example if you want to maximize muscle hypertrophy we know that great more training volume on average will probably lead to greater results that's where we factor in what the client has also done in the past what they've recovered from and so on and so forth but then science says okay this is the direction you need to take as far as training volume we know from the current available evidence, the training frequency does not seem to play a huge role. We know that we can be relatively flexible with training loads. Um, and at the same time, we also uh, know that they're probably, it's probably best that they do a lot of their training at long muscle lengths and utilize a range of motion that allows them to do that. All that, that base is built by science and we, we can have, a certain, uh, we can have a certain amount of confidence in that our program will be taking a lot of basic box, boxes because of the current scientific evidence, which we can then modify based on the individual's preference. If we were to take things back in the 70s, where exercise science was still in its absolute infancy, and we solely, so, solely relied on the word of experts at the time, meaning famous bodybuilders, powerlifters, and coaches, you would be looking at extremes one extreme being you know the dorian yates's and the what's his name mike mentors mm -hmm. of the time um and then the arnold's one saying high volume is it four hours in the gym the other person saying it's uh, one set is all you need um light versus heavy 
and that I, I will sort of add to Mike's Mike Israel's point that yeah, in theory, I would agree that maybe Ronnie Coleman would be bigger. Does it, does that mean that Ronnie Coleman would be substantially bigger? Probably not. But would Ronnie Coleman be as injured now as uh, if we had more signs back in the day? And he was like, you know what? You don't really need the triple ply, a uh, three RM squad uh, two weeks out from the Olympia. But we also um, we also wouldn't know much about regional hypertrophy. Do we need to do just squats or do we need leg extensions or like sissy squats that will um, allow our quads to be more fully developed? Um, all those things were not really clear back in the day when science was not there. But now and we're still at a point where exercise science is, is growing. And there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of things that we need to fix as far as scientific rigor, methodology and so on and so forth and transparency. But I do not th- I, 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 I think that an evidence based program is relatively clear um to 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 make and we can have much more confidence in that program working versus back in the day where we would have to sort of either go with one train of thought school of thought or the other and the same goes with sports like strongman and powerlifting where we are currently seeing more and more data come out on you know force production and whether using very high fatiguing sets makes sense uh, or whether we can pull pull back on some things and all th- those are things that we can directly implement in working with not only average people but elite athletes and you have many people like the strength guys uh, so Jason Tremblay Ben Escrow who work with some of the best powerlifters in the world at the moment who are constantly drawing from that science and from from our research with the minimum effective dose for for power lifters and are informing their practice and it is making an actual difference versus back in the day where you'd have to sort of rely on what one coach said what the other coach said grab a few books and then sort of trial and error everything with a lot of co-founders and a lot of like um a, a, a lot of cloudiness uh, to to put it scientifically as far as your judgment goes so sure real quick uh, gents my proposal here now i want to hear alex respond and then is it cool if i go back to Milo? just just so there's a better conversation flow would that be acceptable just so we don't have like 15 points 15 points awesome yeah alex please yeah sure um so to start off uh, to start off uh, a little bit of an olive branch is that i i think that there is a huge problem with anecdote i think there's a huge problem with the way uh, gym culture was organized i came up in like the high school weight room which is probably one of the worst ways to learn anything about anything. Uh, and it's probably made worse for the fact of high school coaches trying to tell you what to do. And then I graduated from there into the weight room at like a 24 hour fitness where you have everything from, you know, guys that were repeating their prison workouts in the corner uh, to people that just were replicating their worst idea of what Arnold's training program was like. And guys that had been lifting the same weight for the same sets and reps for 35 years, trying to tell you what works. And, it's an absolute mess. Uh, I mentioned martial arts and having complex systems. Um, I mean, it, it traces back to like how you deal with anything where there's a lot of variables where you have to run through a simulation over and over and over and have that selective pressure. That's how you get really firm grasps on things that are too complex to build from scratch and to build from first principles. And I would like lifting to do something like that. It'd be great if there were things like dojos or gyms where you go in and they did that at West Side. They, uh, Shaco did that in his gym. You're there, you're doing exactly what their ideology is and you're fleshing it out. You're getting the best possible application of that as more people run through it. Theoretically, if you had thousands of gyms that did that and then they could compete against thousands of gyms that did their own ideology, you could make some firm conclusions. Exercise science would be really useful in crunching data to figure out how these stack up together. And that that would be fantastic. I don't know that that's ever gonna happen, but that's my grand idea on how the culture could kind of fix itself if, you know, people hitting 2000 pound totals ever became as desirable for the average person, which probably not. Um, We're, we're stuck with all of our athletes and talent dedicated people going to professional sports. So, uh, so yeah, that is a problem. That's something we have to fix. Now, part of the problem when I think from my experience and these other systems that exist and have been evolving for the last, you know, 150 years or so, the big problem is the number of variables that you have. It's all the confounding variables. That doesn't just mean the things you can't really grasp when you when you do the study. That means uh, the dimensions of fuzziness that are created by uh, the context of the entire program, because every individual thing you can talk about, volume, 
you know, we're talking about it in terms of, well, we know the best volume tends to be how volume impacts you is directly affected by every single other variable in the system. And anybody that works with these different types of systems realizes that where if you're going to pick a certain range, everything else has to kind of move around it. So the question of what the optimal exercise selection is or frequency outside of the context of everything else going into that program, I find not to be that useful and is probably going to give you less and less resolution as time goes on. There's also the context of we've talked about uh, genetics. That's the ghost in the machine. Everybody loves to talk about. You have an anecdote that kind of works against a narrative. It's like, well, that guy's the genetic freak, you know, and it might be true, but the problem is we can't define it. We can't talk about it. Genetics are, you can count genetics. You can, um, you can measure exactly what the coding is. You can have so many different combinations. Does that mean we're talking about psychology, aggression, pain tolerance, anthropometry? Exercise scientists love to use a squat and it probably has the single most noise relative to the individual than any other exercise you could use. Um, is it how fast you grow muscle? How many different pieces of genetic material determine how fast you grow muscle or how long you'll grow for. And we talk about it like, well, they can grow from anything, which talent scouts know you want to invest money. You're not doing it in another study. You're doing it in getting more talent because that provides the most consequential uh, effect to the outcome. So it makes sense to think, okay, well, there's probably different strategies in theory. If we had this information that would probably be more or less appropriate based on the individual, but we don't have that. And exercise science as it stands right now can only do averages, can only lump people together and hope it all comes out in the wash. And that gives at best, best case scenario, a starting point for somebody assuming you're in the middle of that bell curve. But the default recommendation should be for people, hey, things are gonna have to change to be tailored to you if you want something that you consider optimal in the context of that broader program. The third piece of context that this one boils my blood all over the place, not just in exercise science, but training in general sucks at dealing with this. And that is the context of time. Take that individual, take that entire complex system where all those variables are going to inevitably have some different outcome. What happens after workout one? What happens after workout 10? What happens after workout 100? Because we talk about things being optimal, but the body is an adaptive machine. Adaptation is definitionally growing muscle, building adaptation so that the stress you experienced is inert. So do you talk about something in the beginning as saying like, hey, this grew me 6% more than people over there, it's optimal. Well, what does it do six months from now? What does it do six years from now? No matter how optimal the thing is, you're on the hook for progressing. So there's the stress of what goes on in the workout, but then there's the way you increase stress over time to keep that going. And that's inevitably going to require strategies that don't have anything to do with uh, the way we think about hypertrophy or growth right now, which is everything you do carries on its shoulders. Like this is a certain percentage of the potential growth you could get. We talk about like where volume potentially drops off and coming from strength sports, volume is default, something that you manipulate over time. You don't set it and forget it. It's something that as it's uh, accumulating, you build up fatigue, but as you build up a tolerance to it, you tend to grow muscle. It's also something that accumulates fatigue to a point where you have to strip it back eventually to get some type of growth to catch up. And that's absent from the models of how we think about hypertrophy. And that is something that stands out that uh, it seems when we talk about strength, it's like a foregone conclusion that you need more complexity. And when you look at programs that decouple volume and intensity, or they have heavy, light, medium days, where everything doesn't have to be in the effective rep zone, uh, or if you're talking about deloads, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that if you're going to keep running these workouts together, fatigue has to dissipate. And it doesn't seem that that comes into any of the dis discussion about what grows you. It seems very much to be, well, this is the value we figured out in a vacuum that is going to produce the best result. And it's like, given what? So that's something that I take issue with. I think you have to start it at a complex, uh, a system of sufficient complexity. I don't think you're going to be able to do this atomic approach where you're finding out uh properties of volume, properties of frequency, properties of exercises, and then assemble them together like Lincoln logs or Legos to build up a, a fully complex system. I think you have to start at the level of the system. And just like with drug resistant bacteria, gain of function research, just like with um, teaching, you know, robots or simulations to walk or to engage in like RPGs and beat them faster, given all the immense amount of strategy, points of strategy that could go on. You have to start with the complexity and let the simulation run itself. I just don't see a situation where you're going to be able to piece these things together. And then the final thing I'll say is that um, with regards to the initial point of, is this an evidence-based thing? If you really have to stretch yourself, if you're sitting down and writing something or giving advice, consider very thoroughly exactly how many things are you recommending that are specifically explicitly shown in the research? 
I feel like if anybody's being honest, they're going to recognize that most of what makes up a program is something that has been around for a while. Most of their decision making is likely to produce a good result anyways. And it, it's not, uh, PAC made a comment about uh, a sign that the program is working or make you confident the program is working. The claims aren't about whether or not the program works. Everything works. And how well it works depends on the individual and the recent training history. Uh, the claims are being made that it's optimal. And that's where my brain kind of breaks because I think the question doesn't even make sense unless you can engage with all of the other confounding variables that exist. And I just don't think you can. Who wants to kick it off? Pack? I'm guessing you're Is pointing it, down at me. Yeah, po yeah. No, oh, sorry. I said um, uh, either, either of you, uh, Milo, do you, who, who wants to go? I was pointing at Milo because he was, uh, it was, oh, Milo, it was his turn. I was above it, above him in my screen, <laughs> but uh, my giga brain of a scientist allowed me to assume he was <laughs> above me on his screen. Anyways, yeah. let me respond to some of these claims. Um, one thing I want to circle back to real quick, and this is not a major point in the original video, and I don't think it'll be a major point in this debate, but the way that fraud was presented within sports science in the original video, uh, to me, you just read as making a sort of blanket statement around the state of sports science. It's worth mentioning that the two, well, the one instance of fraud that was mentioned, uh, well, suspected fraud, rather, by Barbalo and colleagues uh, with regards to falsifying data, and another instance by Jacob Wilson, uh, again, alleged fraud, I'm not claiming anything here, are basically the only two that I can think of within sport and exercise science when it comes to lifting research or nutrition research, when it comes to hypertrophy and strength. So I think claiming that fraud is this rampant issue that is meaningfully impacting sports science might be pushing a little bit too far. Uh, I think it's definitely an issue to be aware of with any scientific pursuit, but I think we shouldn't oversell the issue, essentially. Um, with that aside, I think I want to respond to some of the arguments put forth just now by Alex. One thing is the idea that, for example, martial arts has a lot more of its practices informed by the past, you know, hundreds of years of practice than it does through science. And in martial arts, that may or may not be true. But to bring it back to some of the variance and complexity that Alex brought, brought up with biological systems, it's worth acknowledging that this very much applies to anecdotal evidence as well. So when we're deciding what is the single best tool, or at least the main tool that we want to use to inform our practice, we need to acknowledge that, hey, some of these issues with one tool also apply to the other tool. And in fact, one tool, in this case, anecdotal evidence, may have even less power to control for some of this noise than others. And that's one thing I want to mention is, um, Alex, you kind of seem to focus mostly on studies that are internally valid and kind of proof of concept and taking issue with how those are interpreted. I think it's important to acknowledge that you're taking more so issue with how these studies are interpreted versus how they're conducted, right? Because these studies do aim to minimize the impact of confounding variables by controlling for as many things as possible, right? Or at least influential things. So for example, if we know that volume is an influential variable when it comes to hypertrophy, then studies looking at how close to failure you train and how that makes hypertrophy will try and equate for how many sets each group does so that that noise is reduced to to the greatest extent that we can possibly reduce it right and so just making clear that studies do have the inherent advantage of trying to minimize that noise and only manipulating one variable at a time and so yes there is still going to be noise but it is going to reduce that noise so that you know in the case of one good bodybuilder versus another slightly better bodybuilder, let's say, for example, I don't know, Mike Menser and Roy Coleman, right? As far as their training approaches go, quite distinct. The volumes used by these two people were quite distinct in terms of, you know, Mike Menser might have been doing 5 to 15 sets on average per muscle group or less per week, whereas Ronnie Coleman was frequently doing triple that, you know? And yet one was better than the other. Does that provide us with much predictive power as to whether one approach was better than the other? With the amount of noise and how many more influential variables there are that aren't controlled for, no. And I think when you're dealing with a small sample size of elite athletes and much more influential variables, like, for example, genetics, as you mentioned, like sleep, like stress, are we really going to be able to detect the influence, for example, of range of motion during Ronnie's squat on his hypertrophy, right? Could we really have told from 
let's say Mike Mentor squad deeper, right? And let's say, for example, in a parallel universe, Mike Mentor got bigger. Could we tell Ronnie, well, look, Mike, like Mike's bigger than you and he squats deeper. So you should squat deeper to get bigger legs. We couldn't tell that that easily. And we need bigger samples and we need to accurately control specific variables and not others to be able to tell whether on principle, one approach works better than another on average. And that's something I want to come to as well, is that you mentioned that exercise science only deals in averages. That's not entirely correct. So we do nowadays look a lot more at variance. And for example, whether there is individual response and the degree to which different people respond differently to a given intervention, right? So as I mentioned in my video, there has been a call in medicine in the past, but nowadays exercise science as well, to try and assess, okay, do different people respond meaningfully differently, for example, to range of motion or to volume or to what have you? And so one thing, for example, that you mentioned was we need to account for previous training history. And that is actually something that studies have looked at. It's like, okay, well, does previous training volume impact how you respond to future training volume? Like, for example, if you had low volume before, does that impact how you're going to respond to high volume or what have you? And for example, a recent review paper by Hammond and colleagues broadly showed that the findings are kind of inconsistent as to whether your previous training impacts how you're going to respond to future training. And so I think some of these assumptions that we make in practice, which I've made in the past as well, like in the past when I'm in the gym and I see someone who's been training with high volumes their whole life, and they're like, yep, I'm going to try low volume, you know, part of me is like, ah, you might lose some muscle, you know? But equally, those are assumptions that we need to verify and test. And I think the best way to test them isn't to... In an ideal world, we could do what you're suggesting, right? Just look at a large volume of anecdotes, which yes, lack the internal control and validity of many studies, but that we can mostly make up for via sufficiently sophisticated analyses and sheer sample size, if we have hundreds of thousands of people. But ultimately, we're not having those data sets of that many people that we can look at confidently. And so until then, th this is kind of the best we got, I think. I think that with studies, it's just worth mentioning that most of the studies that you're referring to and kind of referring to as atomic, namely that they only look at one variable in isolation, and so you can't necessarily take those findings and apply them to your training verbatim because your training doesn't look like the training of people in your studies. I think that's a valid point. But the studies you're mentioning are mostly internally valid proof of concept studies, typically. By internal, internally valid or internal validity, what I'm referring to essentially is that the study is seeking to answer or to test a concept in its purest form. So essentially, when everything else is equated for, and we take a relatively simple, straightforward approach, does one approach, for example, higher volume, yield better muscle growth than another approach, for example, lower volume? And those studies are highly internally valid because they control for everything else. They sometimes even control for genetics and sleep and stress by having within subject designs, wherein they train one arm with high volume, for example, and another arm with lower volume. And so a lot of those really influential confounders that plague our inferences when it comes to anecdotes are essentially washed away, right? Because we are doing within subject design that controls for a lot of those things, right? Um, the other, on the other end of the spectrum of these internally valid studies, we have more ecologically valid studies where we do try and study the population that might try and apply these findings, where we do try and use programs that resemble or mimic what is used in practice. As an example, I am currently running a range of motion study where contrary to many studies, we're not using untrained lifters. We're using people who've been training for three years. We're using a program that is hopefully somewhat similar to what people use in practice. So they're training the upper body three days a week, which is, you know, a frequency that many people use in their training. And they're doing multiple exercises for each muscle group involved. So multiple variations of overhead press, multiple variations of chest press, multiple variations of vertical pulling and rowing and what have you, using a volume that is similar to what people use, so between 10 and 20 sets per week per muscle group. And so but there are studies out there that do try and look at ecologically valid contexts. And with those studies, you can look at those and say, well, this looks pretty similar to what I do. And these people have been training for at least a year or two. And for a lot of people, that will be close enough to what they do that they can draw reasonable inferences from that. I think we have to acknowledge that each type of study, the more internally valid proof of concept study and the more ecologically valid study that is more close to what you would do in practice, they both have their pros and cons. I think we need both in order to have confidence that A, something works on principle, and then B, that it will translate to the context of what you're speaking of. This has been the case for many years now in medicine, for example, where for the past few decades, there's been a call for a distinction to be made between efficacy and effectiveness. Efficacy essentially refers to, in the context of this study, you know, over eight weeks in the lab, 
does intervention, for example, taking this drug, help you with the outcome of your interest, for example, your symptoms in a given illness? And then that's effect efficacy, right? But then you also have effectiveness, which is essentially the opposite, where it's, okay, we know this intervention works on principle, it is efficacious, does it actually translate into practice? And I think I would be remiss not to, to mention that there are sports science studies out there that are more so focused on effectiveness as opposed to efficacy. Alex. All right. <clears throat> oh, did Pack want to... Can I, can I uh, add Alex. just... So, can I add just a... <laughs> A little minor point, so sure. just, just for the sake of the argument. So if we were to remove science altogether and solely rely on, on anecdote, especially in our applied field, it is likely that we would rely mostly on, you know, elite genetic individuals who get the most results and have the most impressive physiques and the most impressive lifts. And similarly to environments like, let's say, Westside Barbell, which produced a lot of world champions or very strong lifters, which then brings on even more co-founders and more and muddies the water further. And I wanted to quote one of uh, one of your videos where you talked about uh, fixing your deadlift, where you said that I desperately researched how good deadlifters do the deadlift, but that didn't help any. The best in the world has such a varied approach to deadlifting that it almost seemed like the training practices were not actually the thing responsible for the world class performances. Some pulled frequently, some did this, some did that. And so in a, in a scenario where we don't have exercise science guiding us and, and doing exactly what Milo said, we would be left with mostly um, anecdotes from genetic freaks or elite lifters and their coaches who would be sort of providing us with information that may not necessarily apply to the average individual and would vary quite a bit in terms of um, their recommendations. So technique cues, volume recommendations, loading recommendations, frequency, what worked, what didn't. And then it would boggle down to who won the most Mr. Olympias, who uh, had the strongest deadlift, which gym produced the strongest mm -hmm. lifters, completely ignoring whether Westside Barbell, as far as like access to uh, different populations and different ethnicities, maybe was closer to a larger pool of individuals, et cetera, et cetera. So just wanted to throw that on top. Sure. Uh, so I'll address that really quick and then I'll go back to, uh, to Milo's cases. <clears throat> um, I uh, absolutely agree that uh, focusing on the best performers is a problem. In no way, shape, or form do you want the the best um, Olympians or the best bodybuilders to be able to do, to try and set the bar for what people should uh, be doing. Uh, like I said, talent scouting is huge because it's the most consequential thing. If you're Russia and you want to win another Olympic gold medal in weightlifting, you dedicate your money to finding the best talent who's going to grow from everything and then make sure that you're bribing the right WAD officials so they can keep doping. That's that's the recipe in sports if you want to guarantee it. So um, what I uh, don't necessarily agree with is that that would by default just leave us uh, to follow them and with no other information, because given the nature of this field, it, it's a very consumer driven field, very bottom up. It's not like uh, pro sports where you have a billion or whatever. You have a lot of football players and then you just have fans that watch. So everything's oriented towards the best performers, uh, lifting culture in general, for every one Olympian, there's a thousand people that are just lifting, uh, just cause. So again, using martial arts as the example, the, the thing moves forward, not just based on what the, the best performers do, but what on everybody who exists in these different hubs would record when dealing with average people, because an average coach an average uh, a trainer is going to engage with a bunch more regular ass people than they are going to engage with somebody who is, um, who is elite. And that just comes down again, this is all hypothetical. I don't know how the field would ever transition into something like this, but in that scenario, uh, it would just be a matter of making sure that there was some standardization of how people implemented their policies according to whatever school of thought they, um, they were part of, and then recording the things that tended to work for most people. Um, that's what I would think. So I, I don't I don't necessarily believe that uh, without science to, to check this work the way it does now, at least with uh, research, that we would be left without anything, because if that was true, I mean, none, none of these other fields would be able to discover what they have. So going back to Milo's point, he started out uh, talking about fraud in the field. This is a hard one because. Like, I understand you don't want muck being thrown at the field like every everybody there is uh, a charlatan and they're just trying to get ahead. But that exists. And it's not as if 
I don't know the degree to which I said exercise science or implied exercise science is specifically susceptible. Um, but like I said, I just uh, mentioned Francesca Gino in, uh, she was a Harvard behavioral scientist. This happens all over the place. Um, there's, and it's, it's in weirdly egregious ways. If you ever go down that rabbit hole, people that were just shameless, but in those fields, the extra uh, kind of mathematical literacy you need. And again, that's not a knock against exercise scientists, but there's just more rigor involved in some of these other fields, given how easy it is to get past the peer review process, uh, which a lot of them are underpaid. A lot of them are volunteers, uh, given how hard it is, how much mathematical literacy you need to be able to sniff it out. And you have to have the motivation to sniff it out. Greg Knuckles was the one who outed the Barbalo studies. And it's the reason they all got retracted. Omar knows Greg Knuckles. How many people in the field are the human calculators that Greg Knuckles has? I don't think I've ever met anybody else who has the pairing of actual uh, experience along with knowing the exact math, like to the T. Um, I'm not saying that people don't exist, but you just have to kind of weigh it out. How many people are able to sniff this stuff out? How many people are motivated to sniff it out? I think it's a little bit dismissive to suggest actively that it isn't a problem because these problems arise when people don't check their work enough, not when they're checking their work too much. Um, but then again, it's not like I have some special evidence. I'm just broadly pointing that like, hey, these are things you got to be aware of because there are massive incentives for people who have to meet these requirements. If you're going to do, you need funding. If you're going to do a study, you better make sure it gets published. That means it better be statistically significant. That means it better not support the null hypothesis. Uh, that means it better be interesting and new. Um, and for that reason, it selects a lot of stuff that's irrelevant or that's obvious. Uh, that doesn't do anything. And again, that's super evident in popular psychology, which I will say again, is an absolute shit show. Um, and so anyway, it's just something to be aware of to have in your back pocket. And again, I'm educating a group of people that probably haven't heard this before. Um, so I don't know, I would take a little bit of issue with saying that it's actively not a problem, but it's just something to be aware of. I don't have any special knowledge on the degree to which it does or doesn't go on in exercise science. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, I took, I take a little issue with, um, the term the best use the best in the context of is this going to be the best thing um because i think it's it's not so much about the way the studies are done because the problems i have with any potential limitations of the studies or sources of error that is meaningless if you consider that the types of questions that are being asked don't even really make sense uh, the idea of best, again, the human organism changes and adapts. What was the best for you two weeks ago is not the best for you two weeks uh, two weeks from now. Every study is limited by time. None of these studies follow people through six years or even so many months to find out what happens when they become resistant. That's a big question mark in a black box. What happens when we take our optimal values and people become resistant to it? Um, and, and again, so many other systems implement things to get around this that, that break out the mold of how we think of individual workouts. You have decoupling of volume and intensity. You have big and little workouts. You have workouts that aren't that stimulative, but they're kind of stimulative. But in the big picture, that's really good because it also allowed you to recover. So anything you do, you have this push pull where if something's strong enough to, to get a stimulation, to uh, get a growth response, it also has this thing pulling in the opposite direction because you put yourself in a recovery hole. So that tension, it's only if the stimulus can overpower the recovery that anything happens at all. And again, that goes back to like the accumulation of fatigue along with a whole bunch of other things. So I, I'm not really sure it's useful to talk about individual variables or even individual programs if they're the best and forget about for an individual, even if we're talking about for a genuine pop, a general population, because that question changes over time. Um, Anybody who's peaked for a contest, whether it's a, a strongman contest or a bodybuilding show, your training has to change for the meet. You come back, you decondition very quickly, and you know that your sensitivity to certain things is different. God help you if you have a study where somebody was in really good shape six months ago or so many years back, and they haven't done much of anything, whatever they do is going to make that uh, look good. And that's not even a dig against, that's not even trying to establish another source of error. That's trying to say that it's just, it's very obvious that exactly how you grow, it does not go that way forever. And it's heavily biased by what happens before. Um, uh, let's see, you talked about reducing noise. I can appreciate attempts to reduce noise. And that's something that you should absolutely be wanting to do. It's just the ability you have to reduce noise, given the insane amount of confounding variables. 
uh, you're, we're going from evaluating something, considering all the different things that aren't in that study that you can't touch, and then drawing a conclusion about giving a recommendation to a population of people, knowing full well that the margin of that the brackets are operating in, they're going to have to move around anyways. So I think in pragmatic terms, if people are supposed to be moving around to whatever benefits them, it is in their best interest to learn strategies for that, because it doesn't matter what you start with if the end goal is to get you to something that is productive for you. And that's something, again, I think the experience, the anecdote, the bro science should focus on that. That's what I try to write about. How do you give people tools to know how to find their way to that? And I think that is infinitely more powerful as a strategy than focusing on what you theoretically might start off of as a, as a guideline. Um, and again, going back to all the other researchers I looked at, they'll all, all say very clearly, this is a guideline, this is a starting point, things have to change for you. And that really is a stark contrast to how some people will represent the authority of the specific conclusion, conclusions that they're trying to promote. And then once again, that extra, uh, that extra cloud, which is how the consumer interprets it, which again, in one ear, out the other. Um, uh, let me see. I can't, I'm talking faster than I can read, uh, which isn't very fast. Um, oh, one of the big questions I have, and I would actually posit this to you guys, um, cause I've talked enough, but like, would you guys expect to see as this field moves forward, would you expect to see training converge? Meaning that as things go on, you find the same recommendations across the board in something that looks like a completely realized program where individual variables don't differ because everything is so secured that this is kind of the right answer for everybody. And to what degree would you expect that to be the case or not be the case? I'd be really interested to give up the floor just to hear what either of you uh, have to say about that. In a in a fanta in a like hypothetical scenario, yeah. Like if exercise science uh, continues to make discoveries forward, would you expect training methods to convert? Like, would you expect something like a, a grand unified theory of of gains, where you expect everything to converge on a particular program that would be used uh, across the board? It's a, it's a bit of a tricky question. I assume like in a hypothetical scenario where you poured um, millions and millions in, in sports science and let's say, you know, Elon Musk woke up tomorrow and said, OK, we're going to do exercise science and I'm going to get the uh, James Steele. So and the Milo Wolves and uh, a lot of wolves there and have them. Uh, have them design studies that are transparent, that are this, that are that. And we do a lot of advanced uh, statistical analyses and have huge samples and this and that. I do feel that we will be able in a few years to confidently uh, say that, you know, for, the, for again, for the majority of people with, with plenty of confidence that X amount of volume is probably going to produce superior results versus this or that, or you need to be within a specific RPE range to absolutely maximize uh, strength development, or these, uh, this is the, the best peaking strategy for powerlifting, um, and so on and so forth. But that's a hypothetical where yeah. we are pouring millions and millions. Oh, However, yeah, yeah. To, to be clear, to be clear, I'm, I'm exactly like, so I'm stretching out to the ultimate conclusion, like take half the population yeah. to study the other half of the population to run this study and crunch the numbers just Best case scenario, let me grant you all the statistical power you need. Um, and you could run, you could come up with studies however you wanted to try to flesh that out over time. Um, but you're, I, I just want to point out, you're talking about, again, individual variables. I mean, those have to go together. So is your assumption that when you find those ranges, you just put them together into a super program and that's the thing that gets disseminated to everybody? You would, you would have, uh, you, you would have, um, let's say a control panel where you would enter certain variables that are individual and then it would say, okay, this is the best program based on those variables. I sleep X amount of hours. I'm this and I'm that, but I see Milo wanting to, to say something. Yeah. I think this is kind of missing the idea that whenever we're conducting research on a given topic, we take studies from being closer to something like a proof of concept, looking at that variable in isolation to gradually Designing studies, for example, there's been studies where they're comparing and there are plans for studies where they're comparing different volumes and different proximities to failure at the same time. For example, if you're just doing one set to failure, is that as good as two sets to say two reps in reserve or what have you? There are studies being conducted that try and combine different variables and different iterations of programs to compare those. But in order to even arrive at reasonable study designs to compare different programs to eventually get to what you're suggesting, we first need to establish 
Is there a dose response relationship with this variable? Is there some sort of sweet point with this variable when the other ones are sort of equated for, right? And then we can form study designs where we can compare different iterations of programs we think might be a pretty solid bet. And I think this is evidenced by the idea that recommendations for volume, for relative intensity, for frequency, for range of motion, for rep ranges, for a lot of things have converged for a couple of decades at least now. Like it's not as though we haven't made progress and as though the evidence is nearly as heterogeneous, I think, as the anecdotes we have of successful bodybuilders, for example, because we are controlling for many of these things. And so we're able to form recommendations based on studies whose findings are relatively consistent. Because we don't have perfect power, they're not perfectly consistent. I'll, I'll grant you that. And I think any experimental science with a high degree of variance due to a biological system will have some degree of inconsistency because you can never achieve perfect power. But recommendations have converged for years and decades, and that is leading to our ability to design studies that are more ecologically valid, that try and compare different approaches that combine different variables being manipulated, like, for example, volume and relative intensity at once. So I think it is something we're arriving towards and we're, we've been working towards for decades. And I think that's where the benefit of science ultimately lies as opposed to something like anecdote where it's just difficult to draw those inferences. So uh, if I can, um, so I would say I'm not entirely sure that things, uh, that things have been converging. And I know that, again, we can't look at what the elites do to inform our training, but you have to assume that if you're in a saturated field where there's very high incentives, that you, in some sense, you have to have every ace in the deck to, to get that GOAT status. Um, and if it's not the case, if genetics make that much of a difference, it's like, uh, you know, holy hell, let's just all call it a day right now. But um, th I think that's, a, that's an assumption, but it's a reasonable assumption that everybody together at the elite level fighting each other out, you're going to see a clear reward for something. If it's not universally better, at least in some sense, better for that individual, given their circumstances. And what we see, I just did an hour and 45 minute long documentary about the entire history of bodybuilding culture. Um, and it's not just me talking. It was legitimately, I, I probably covered three dozen different bodybuilding templates going back to the Victorian strongman era and the basic recommendations that have led to, uh, strength records, um, throughout history, in addition to physiques, um, have been very similar in a very broad sense, as far as progressive overload, the types of movements you use, the consistency, the effort, and so on since the 1800s. And then what you see is a swelling of a, a talent pool. Of course, you see the uh, popularization of drugs uh, around the 50s or 60s. Um, but a lot of what the best in the world do at the top of bodybuilding, where there's very high incentives at the top of Olympic lifting, not only very high incentives, you have uh, state uh, subsidized coaches and drug programs and and everything, people living on compounds, people being, that's their path out of poverty if you're in the right part of the world. Uh, massive incentives being given. And what you see is people are essentially doing the same things that they've done over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, you also see a huge divergence of methods that seem to give world-class results. The Bulgarian method looked like it was written by an angry high school sophomore. Max every lift, three times a day, six days a week. If you don't break in half, uh, you're gonna be a world champion. And a lot of those numbers haven't even be, been beaten to this day. Um, you take the most heavy handed, over sim, uh, overly simple uh, approach, and it seems to have, uh, it seems to have uh, created a virtually unbeatable uh, outcome. So I'm not seeing anywhere I look in sport, uh, people really making use of what's coming out of the research. And I, I feel like I'm certainly not seeing anything converge because if you look at the entire sea, especially as the, the thing gets more complex, Olympic lifting is pretty simple. Um, you look at something like strongman that's wildly varied. You look at powerlifting. I mean, the best powerlifters range from diehard bodybuilders to people that only squat bench and deadlift once a week, go home, eat a ham sandwich and put uh, recovery uh, on, uh, on supercharge mode. So, the more variables that exist, it seems like there is less ability to converge and you get wildly different frequencies. You get wildly different exercise selection. You get wildly different uh, tempos. And it just feels to me that when you fixate on the variable, and, this, and again, we're back to trying to eliminate the noise by isolating the variables in a vacuum. And one of my main points is that the variables don't work in a vacuum. So if you can isolate it, but then you can only talk about it in the context of the way it was studied, because the second it gets put into a different context, the outcome is entirely different and you have no information about it. And that's a problem I have. So when you said that um, the noise kind of gets washed away, I, I don't have reason to believe that that noise gets washed away. And it doesn't seem like when you pull the lens back that you are actually seeing the most incentivized lifters in the world 
uh, converge on single methods. It seems they all live and die by what does my body respond to and how do I get there as fast as possible? Alex, uh, yes. do you want to go? There's one thing I want to say, Pat. Can I say it or? Let me just quickly, go. just so I just wanted to, to touch mm -hmm. on, first of all, it's important to clarify that this is mostly an observation f from your end and an assumption that things have not really transferred. So, for example, um, my PhD was on the minimum effective dose. I've spoken with coaches from the NBA, uh, with elite power lifters, elite coaches and elite athletes who have said, hey, this was useful. We're now actually uh, implementing that. But I feel as if we're slightly changing the, the conversation here because the this whole thing started from um, exercise science is killing your gains, being directed to the average individual rather than, you know, your professional athlete uh, or whatever. And I do not foresee many, many scenarios in practice where you would look, for example, at the, the length, uh, at the um, volume research or the uh, research on range of motion. And that would not apply to the, the majority of gym goers, uh, even if their circumstances are somewhat more, more unique, like, or like the, the literature on machines versus free weights or training frequency, or recently we published a, a paper on uh, training technique. I think for the average uh, viewer who wants to be big and strong and, and, and hit PRs, I don't, I don't see a scenario where their circumstances are so different to what's been done in research in young trained individuals where you have all the details laid out uh, in the studies themselves, uh, where they, they won't be able to apply that information whatsoever. Alex, so one thing I do want to say, I'm moderating here. I'm sitting out. I'm also a professional YouTuber, don't have the PhD, but I do want to say just very quickly, because we are talking, let's say now about elite athletes, and maybe we could shift the conversation. Pat just uh, spoke about his research, the minimum effective dose. We're also talking about strength athletes. Um, I want to talk about this concept, though, of convergence, whether or not it's occurring, because I will say from being in the space, observing, let's say, tested powerlifters, like IPF tested powerlifters, and the practices that top tier coaches will do, I will say as an outside observer from speaking to many of them, like Eric Helms, Ben Escrow, like Joey Flex, uh, Joe Game Day, um, Marcellus, like Swole Fat, like you just go over like all these systems, um, that I would say that a lot of them are now using science informed practices in terms of their decision making, like how they organize their programs and so on and so forth, that is marrying their experience alongside what they've observed and then what tends to be trends elsewhere that come from um, various places as opposed to because uh, I was around over a decade ago when, you know, I, I was at Fortis, as an example, did the West Side program. And I remember when Dan Green actually even wrote um, West the West Side, how incendiary wow. once again that was, where he was curious. It was it was the desire and the uh, pursuit, the acquisition of knowledge that he was after. What is the best practice? And I just do wonder, and, and I want you to respond to the other thing in general, whether or not we do think there's a convergence of methodologies or agreed upon, let's say, a standards or things that need to be used in powerlifting. And if that is the case, what is going on there? Because I, I certainly do see the overall increase in performance. And it seems like amongst the coaches, whereas there'd be a wider split of approaches, I would personally feel a, a decade ago at the top, those that seem to perform at the top and the coaches, I see a slight convergence personally. And that's just a complete aside, not trying to participate in the conversation, but please, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, so there's uh, two things I'd like to tackle there. One is about um, the, the discussion of elite athletes uh, versus the average person and what's appropriate or likely to work for the average person. And then the other one is the topic of convergence. So I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, as, as far as uh, what is likely to work for an average person, I mean, you're talking about something that's as wide as the Grand Canyon. Uh, newbies respond to just about everything. I mean, the average person doesn't have difficulty getting their first three or 400 pound deadlift. Typically, if they're consistent, uh, it seems to be once uh, gains stop and then now some wizardry is required to get you moving again, that it becomes a little bit more important uh, than what you do, or a, a little bit more important what you do. Uh, but that cuts to, okay, are you, is what you're doing 
in the individual workout good? Does that tie into the week in an intelligent manner? Does that tie into the block in an intelligent manner? And does that have direction? Because we know terms like progressive overload, that can mean a million different things. And even a lot of people that think they understand it, if you ask them a very focused question about exactly how do I progress my workout to workout, you'll either end up getting a, a flood of like 15 different things you could potentially do, or you'll get them kind of meandering around. But how you progress on top of, even if you found the optimal thing, how you keep that going is very difficult. But when we're talking about the average lifter, we're talking about somebody who um, probably isn't trying to quote unquote, maximize anything. They'll buy research or sorry, they'll buy, um, they'll buy products, books, they'll listen to content about maximizing stuff. But usually it's the same consumer trap of, I want to be able to buy the shortcut. I want to be able to engage with the thing that's going to get it a little faster. We know I think more than anything, and I don't know what the research says, but if you talk to any coach, the amount of extra whatever X factor that you get when you have somebody who absolutely loves to train, who has an immense pain tolerance and is willing to kill themselves, no matter what you give them, that tends to outperform. Um, And that's a rare thing that usually is only conducive to to somebody who's uh, chasing the upper limit. The reason I bring up elite athletes It's not to use their training to inform what they do. It's to suggest that elite athletes have the incentive. They have the desire. They want to be as good as possible, which means they don't want to leave anything on the table. And if it's razor thin between them and the other guys, because that half a percent is what's going to jump you five places at the next big uh, world level contest you do. The assumption is that they're doing everything they can to find out the most correct, legit way uh, to train that's going to yield the best possible result. Um, So that's why I bring that up. And I would think that, again, we're using the term optimal. This is what gets turned around or thrown around. So I'm assuming that when we're talking about average lifters, we're still talking about people that want to do as good as they possibly can, even with their shit genetics, which means you would similarly see a desire or see, sorry, see the outcome where um, what they do would start to converge if it does indeed work out this way. And it's not that there's actually so many genetic differences that could determine uh, outcome and how that plays not with just one variable, but how all those variables fit together in one complete program and how that then evolves over time into your decision making. So that's the only reason I bring up elite athletes. But but yeah, again, it's like that's not who you look for uh, when you're trying to come up with rules for how people uh, for how people put things together. It's just a sign that. Um, where there are the highest stakes, it doesn't seem like that type of attention is being paid to this aspect of exercise science. That was my only point. Um, as far as the topic of convergence, um, you have you have so many different things that come together for a program, so many different, if you multiply each variable out and then you again incorporate time, how that would go in a week, there's countless different iterations of training you could potentially come up with. It's like how, how finite are the rules of music or the notes you could play, but how many different songs can you play just off that? I mean, that's how I think about it. Now, of course, only some of those will be not nonsense, but still there's a lot of potential options. So when you're talking about natural powerlifting, I'll admit that's something I don't have a ton of experience with. When I started lifting, and we were talking about this in the beginning, powerlifting was just a sideshow. Nobody took it seriously. People would go because they were just brave souls and be like, I'm just going to go squat bench and deadlift, even though everybody else is in triple ply Kevlar gear uh, that requires 1200 pounds just to hit depth. That's what it was in like the nineties going into the two thousands. Then you saw the resurgence of raw powerlifting now becoming a thing and lifting was fun again. And it was less of a sideshow. It was more accessible to more people. And the entire world started to follow that rise. We were talking about uh, Lily Bridge and Milanichev and finally breaking Don Reinhardt's record and all of that great stuff. And now it's starting to evolve further. So the biggest stages that have been around have been things like Olympic lifting and bodybuilding. And I would also say powerlifting. However, the specific niche we have of, um, of raw natty powerlifting is kind of an interesting thing. Cause I think it's relatively new, or at least its popularity is probably relatively new. I um, am not surprised that there's certain things that would be coming kind of par for the course. Like Olympic lifting did see that. If you compare Olympic lifting in 1900 versus 1940 versus 1970, there were some changes being made. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there's some persistent uh, convergence on certain things that you do see that tend to be better. Like nobody does a, a split snatch anymore. But on the other hand, within that framework, there still is wild variability that suggests the question of what is optimal for a specific set, exercise, execution, implementation of volume is so dependent on the individual situation that you can't make a broad inference about it. Um, And I would also, I don't want to throw shade at 
the natty powerlifting community. But um, I would not be surprised if there are a lot of things that drive decision making that might not necessarily be what exactly gets the best outcome, but maybe this is how me and all my friends train, or this is what we think is going to be the best thing. Um, I've talked about it's, it's been a couple years since I've talked about how I hate sumo delivery, but you see a lot of people where they, they will go off with their idea of the thing is before they actually get there. Um, even in a way that's not optimal. I learned from strongman that if you're not doing a lot of fucking work bent over in a really shitty position, you're probably not going to get a very strong posterior. Um, and, and that's just an example, but as far as the actual methodology, um, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I can't really, I can't really comment from the natty lifting thing, but I'd be very interested to see what those methods are and how closely they are adhered to uh, at the top level. And I'd also be interested to um, see if there are any outliers, you know, and, and what they do differently or why it might work for them. But that, that's something I don't have a lot of direct experience with. Yeah. So there's a lot to touch on there. Um, there's a few things I want to mention. The first was the idea earlier, and this goes back a little bit, that only significant findings or predominantly significant findings, as in there is a bias towards significant findings being published preferentially over non-significant findings, right? And this is a common idea. Um, the important thing to mention there yet again is that it's important not to present only one side of that coin. We do, in fact, have ways of assessing whether or not this is happening. For example, in meta-analyses, looking at a field of evidence on volume or relative intensity, what have you, we can conduct, for example, a funnel plot analysis, wherein you see, okay, do most of the findings just happen to be barely significant? Because if they do, that's a sign that only the significant findings are being published. There's not a sort of normal distribution of findings that are significant and not significant, as we would expect. So it's important to mention that, hey, some of these issues are absolutely present, but it's not as though we're ignorant to them and uh, sure. we're not already doing our best to address them to a large extent. Um, uh, kind of going forward here a little bit is recommendations. There's a distinction to be made between have practices in the field converged and have scientific recommendations for what is quote unquote optimal converged. Because I think those are distinct things. And the idea that maybe practices overall haven't converged that much, but the recommendations that we have acquired and arrived at through scientific research have converged is an important distinction. And if anything, to me, the idea that, hey, our recommendations have stayed relatively similar for a couple of decades. If anything, they've become a bit more precise and we have a bit more confidence around what volume might be best on average, what relative intensity, et cetera. The idea that there is convergence in that versus in practices suggests to me that science might actually be a better tool to inform practice than just looking at practices because practices still apparently don't seem to be converging very much. And so that's kind of the limitation there. And that's part of the issue with looking at what high-level bodybuilding programs have done for decades or centuries. You just mentioned the issue of the natural powerlifting community. Obviously, there is a uh, normative component to it, right? There's a psychological component to it. There's, hey, what are people around me doing? There's buy-in. There's a bunch of factors that impact practices that are not around effectiveness, right? They might be around what your fellow bro is doing and what seems fun, and a lot of other things. And fortunately, those things don't play into what volume is better for hypertrophy in the research, for example. But they do play into what you see surviving in practice. You see, if you know, if the person who got you into lifting taught you a certain way of lifting, that is going to self-perpetuate. Whereas in research, we tend to test new things and you know see if they work or not. And so that's where research, I think, can win out over just looking at what high-level bodybuilders are doing or even what the widespread practice within hypertrophy training is, like if the average person does five sets, for example. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on is you kind of made the point that if your context is different from the context of the study or if you change your volume, for example, then that directly means that you can't make inferences from a given study to your own training. There is definitely a contextual element, right? Like how... How close to failure you train, for example, will impact how much volume you benefit from, right? But the idea that you cannot make inferences uh, categorically from studies to your own training just because your training isn't exactly the same as it was in those studies, to me, just kind of uh, likely just isn't true. I think you can still make inferences, but the degree to which you can make that inference depends on the similarities between the context of the study and your own. Ultimately, just how ecologically valid was that study to your own context? 
how similar were the two contexts. So I think it's just worth mentioning that it's not categorically, can you make an inference or can you not make an inference? It's more of a continuum, right? And I think we agree there, it's just worth clarifying that, hey, if your context is reasonably similar, like, you know, you've been training for a couple of years, which by the way, is most of the people watching these videos online. So it's not as though the population in these studies is that similar from the people watching a lot of these videos online, I think. Um, certainly with elite athletes, there is more of a disparity between their context and the context within these studies. But I think for the average person, which is ultimately who we're speaking to her, um, who's been training for a few years, it is reasonably generalizable. Um, the final thing I just wanted to mention is I do think the average lifter wants to maximize their outcomes. I think you touched on the idea that they only want to do so when it's not at the expense of sort of time spent in the gym or effort or too much financial burden or what have you. And I do agree with that, but I do think the average lifter still wants to maximize their progress ultimately. And I think that throwing out the idea of optimal altogether, which you seem to do towards the end of your video, I'm not a fan of because in the quest for optimal, we also arrive at what is better or closer to optimal. We may never arrive at what is strictly optimal and we may never arrive at what is the individualized optimal through science purely, but we can certainly arrive much closer to what is going to be close to optimal for the average person and navigate our way from there. And I think that's a much better approach to arriving at what might be optimal for the individual versus just troubleshooting and going off what other good lifters or even just the average lifter is doing around you. Can I touch on the optimal point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also important to, to understand that we are dealing with a niche of strength and hypertrophy enthusiasts and gym enthusiasts that may want to optimize for the fun of it as well and make educated guesses or educated bets rather than know for sure. So like the same with any other niche, I don't know, like I'm trying to think of an analogy. I don't know, car people, for example, I'm sure they do a bunch of stuff, stuff to optimize a speed that are not really based on the most solid of evidence, but for them, just the pursuit of optimal in itself can be fun. And I would also ask like from the biggest evidence-based and science-based sort of channels and resources on YouTube, is there really anybody out there that's saying anything that absurd or counterproductive to gains or anything that discredits experience or personal preference. So I do feel like we we tend to to go like and by we I mean myself and Milo in our circle we are full on against you know the PubMed warriors and the people that uh, misinterpret science and you know <clears throat> will, will hang off the the conclusions of an abstract. Uh, but at the same time, I do not think that there is a huge huge issue where people are missing out on gains because they're getting overly confused um, with, by following the biggest uh, sort of evidence-based names. Sure, there's confusion, but as Milo already alluded to, the, there was confusion before uh, when we were relying mostly on anecdote, and there would be even more confusion if we didn't have science in its place. But um, yeah, that's that's all. Alex. Um, okay. Um... To Pac's uh, point about um, the pursuit of optimal and, and doing it for fun, and I mean, we all do this. It's like I'm not getting uh, I'm not getting a disability check, you know, every time I uh, tear a bicep or something. It's like this is something I go out on a limb for because I enjoy it, and so many people do too. Um, doing something to to try to be as good at it as possible. There's certainly a lot of people in the field that do that. Um, I, I would just question what percentage of the viewership does do it. I think people that have a really robust amount of coaching experience in person uh, and, and in uh, online uh, capacity would probably have a more cynical view of how many people actually want to be optimal. However, but doing things for the love of it, I think on the other side of that coin, experimentation, that's like the kind of shadow of optimal because experimentation is extremely necessary, even when something may not in fact be optimal, because as long as you're recording what the results are and you have some ability to preserve that and carry it forward. That's ultimately how you get closer to what your final form is going to be. And I know I've suffered and benefited a lot from uh, experimentation. I took the scenic route to being competitive at anything because I jumped around and did a lot of shit. Um, if I were to point to, I think the biggest cancers in the field, as far as 
that, that even that's hyperbolic. We're, we're talking about lifting weights here. It's not that serious, but the biggest things that limit people from progress, they otherwise would almost be guaranteed. I think it would be things that derail them from the big rocks. So when I consider the big rocks, uh, the things that provide the most uh, effect, the most real tangible effect to whether or not somebody is going to be good long-term. And the thing that is probably the most easily fucked up that happens uh, repeatedly. Um, you're talking about people having a baseline of work that they're comfortable with, which can exist in a pretty wide nebula uh, and learning how to progress in a very deliberate way, learning how to track the recovery. This is the hard thing, having enough experimentation to, to try to find new things while not having so much that you're bouncing around. And if you can do that long term and take notes and think critically, then eventually you start to get a right answer. And the reason I say throw optimal out the window is because you can assume that most of your training is not going to be linear. You know, it's not like fat loss. It's not linear. It, you, you get long punctuated periods of nothing. I know I've experienced that. And then all of a sudden there's a certain change, something that happens where that stress recovery balance gets hit just the right way, or it's some novel stimulus that you couldn't have accounted for that bumps you forward again. It uh, Again, your training has to evolve with, with you. So if you look at it from that perspective, to consider the idea of something being optimal in any one one specific uh, situation. And even uh, Milo, you had an interview with, uh, or not an interview, you had a discussion with Israel, and uh, he made this point. He's like, if you're not gaining anything, if you're all the way at the limit, you're grinding in this program, optimal is something. Optimal is just a little bit of progress where you otherwise wouldn't have gotten any. And um, what, how that's going to work for you at that given point, I, I just have a hard time believing, is going to rely on what you consider reasonably, gener uh, reasonably generalizable. Um, and it seems as more we talk about actually making inferences, there has to be more and more language that recognizes the inferences have to be vague. They have to be open-ended. They can't be specific. And the thing is, when you're dealing with somebody, your recommendations have to be specific. You have to write something on a piece of paper. And that's what I brought up earlier when I talked about what even is evidence-based, because at the end of the day, you got to take what you know and try to do something specific. So uh, the big rocks, and, uh, and I'll say it again, it's the context of the entire program, each variable interacting differently based on how all the other variables are set. If you do squat three times per week, optimal for one day, whether it's for size or anything else is going to change uh, the types of exercise you can do, how hard you can go on them and so on. Uh, the individual genetic uh, differences and that person's history and how they're going to train when they experience inevitably that brick wall, everybody feels where you're doing the most optimal thing and you just stop growing. And then what comes next has to be decidedly unoptimal. And I want to make sure, I don't know if I, skipped over what Milo said. Um, I, I, I think that's about, I think that's about all I have to say. Uh, yeah. So I just want to highlight that that is, so the issue with missing the, the, the tree, the forest uh, for the tree is, is down to uh, scientific interpretation being poor and not looking at the totality of available evidence. And as you said yourself, science is not giving you, very specific optimal guidelines that you must follow without the the input of trial and error but rather it gives you more general optimal guidelines for let's say training volume frequency range of motion and so on and so forth that you then pair with trial and error to come to an individualized optimal uh, approach and then my question to you would be for example training volume you have you have uh, the data that shows 10 to 20 sets may be best if you were to have two twins and you were to, I don't know, have a, have a bet or somebody will tell you, okay, bet on whoever is going to gain the most muscle. And then one twin was doing 20 to 30 sets and the other one was doing 10 to 20 sets. Just based, so just based on the current scientific evidence uh, and the, your observations, which one would you, would you bet on? Would, you, would it be the 20 to 30 set twin or the 10 to 20 set twin? 20 to 30 set twin or 10 to 20 set, I don't think the evidence gives me any ability to predict that. I mean, uh, odds, if we're going off odds, you can look at the evidence you, you, that exists you, you, and you might come up. But, but here, here's the thing, because because you have the, the research that has gone crazy into the volume territory and there's controversy over. You have the people within each study that experience high amounts of volume do very well. And similarly, people in that same group experience high amounts of volume and don't do well at all. Um, so again, it's we can, we can make a kind of an odds-based statement with regards to what's actually been studied but you can't derive from that any accurate prediction about what's going to happen with two people 
It doesn't have to be accurate. I'm saying it's a it's a hypothetical. You have to bet all your money on one or the other, based okay, on the so current I, evidence. Which yeah, so I I probably bet uh, bet my money on uh, what is it? Ten to twenty is the typical recommendation. Uh, however, this is what I conceptualize. These thought experiments are what I think about because the way you get to the bottom of this, and I think about this whenever we talk about one variable is I wanna know all the different ways that variable was tested. How many different scenarios can that variable exist? Because one of the reasons, God, I saw a study that was dealing, it actually tried to deal with uh, periodization. It was like block periodization versus like, I don't know, either DUP or linear or something. The first thing I think about, what is the best iteration that you can conceptualize of what this looks like? Because now we're talking about a lot of variables. So you can conceptualize the best iteration of what this thing is. I want to see those things pitted against each other in addition to their ability to mold themselves to the individual. So um, what is the, I mean, we're talking about volume. I mean, what's the best uh, uh, application of volume? What does that best program look like? And I think anybody would have difficulty even trying to think of what that, uh, what that would be. If you could even say it's one thing. Like you, you would definitely not start at uh, two to four sets per muscle group per week. You know that, you're probably best starting at 10 plus sets based on the current scientific evidence. So as practitioners, that would be our, our starting point. Same with our minimum dose stuff. If we had, um, if the current literature showed that, hey, a single set a couple of times per week or the studies we did with powerlifters showed that if you're doing two to three sets per week, you're actually regressing and you had three or four studies, it's very unlikely that for the majority of people that you worked with, you would start them at one or two sets per week. Whereas now you can feel confident based on the scientific evidence that you can do that. Um, so... I, and I would, also, yeah. I would also point out that those recommendations are, are pretty broad and they also seem to fall into what most reasonable programs look like. Like, unless you have, I know every, all the kids are on the Mike Mincer bandwagon today, but um, it, it, it seems like it, this was something uh, I remember thinking with Prilipin's chart. I think I did a video about that a long time ago because in powerlifting Prilipin's chart was like the scientific thing that you reference because it made you sound legit. Like I've read the literature, like I know what the Russians did or whatever. Um, and when you break it down, it's like, okay, d d uh, pulled from a different population of elite lifters doing an entirely different exercise um, on a bunch of PEDs. I don't even think anybody has access to the data. It's never been replicated. And then when you actually, the funny thing is when you actually crunch the numbers, you actually accidentally find just about every reasonable set and rep range you could ever come up with. So when people say, oh, I follow Prolipid Shard, I'm like, okay, the so you basically did about anything anybody would have done anyways. Uh, and that's the reason I push back because the, the, the ranges are so big, the margins of error we're talking about, or the margins of recommendations are so broad that, um, again, that gap of interpretation, people are hearing this as if this is something specific I have to stay in, in the middle of, when in reality, the handle you have is on what you do to navigate. And that's what people are missing. And I, I just, I think, I, you said you don't think there's really an epidemic of people missing out on gains. Um, and that, that's a value it's, judgment. I don't know. I don't know how I would con convince you that it's more or less. And I might even be remiss in saying it's as much as I think it is. Um, but I've watched enough uh, of the videos of the way people engage with research. Again, it's Jeff Nippard hanging up. This is a point for failure. This is a point against failure, even though every single study is wildly different from each other. Uh, and people read that and they come to very, very, very specific conclusions about what they think is being said there that has no real basis in reality. And that it's so, so it hinges, I think, on just a value judgment of what the real effect of these interpretations are. So, sorry, I want to, I want to, I want to give another example. You're trying sure. to optimize hypertrophy. You have to choose between um, a, a person training with uh, an emphasis on the stretch versus a person training with the shorter ranges of motion. So mid to short doing the sort of pump training that a lot of bodybuilders advocated for. Again, who do you bet on and why? I don't, I'd, I'd, uh, I, I think most uh, of the valuable lifts that provide the biggest bang for the buck, you're talking about compound movements, typically get done through something like a full range of motion. And then uh, I think there's plenty of room for variability. I mean, I think it's productive at certain points to do things like mid-range partials. Uh, and there's a lot of disagreement on that between coaches and, and bodybuilders. I know that full range of motion, I mean, that's been like a rule for like correct lifting for as long as I've been lifting. And I think it's very valuable. I myself have had have overcome hypertrophic plateaus uh, because I emphasize on a partial range of motion that was able to put a stress in a particular muscle, especially when I'm so used to compound movements that uh, I wasn't otherwise able to do. Now that's not to say that's the only way to do it or that's gonna be correct every time, 
But um, even that, it's like this false choice you have where you have to do one or you have to do the other. Most people do a mix. And I think they do it for that reason, to be well-rounded, to cover all their bases. And because there isn't really a, a firm conclusion. There's a guy, and again, this goes back to, this is anecdotal. This goes back entirely to the power of genetics. This guy, Philip Morris, trained at my gym. I made a video about him as well. He told me the first time I met him, I'm like, what are you bench, dude? Because he was built like a brick shit house. He told me 675. I looked at him in the face and I'm like, you're full of shit. That's like saying I deadlift a thousand pounds. I'm like, I haven't seen you at a contest. Like, no, you don't. That's just a made up number. That's like, I'm an Olympic gold medalist. I'm like, no, you're not. Uh, he legit did. He was an Eric Spotto. He was a bench only gym rat. Every lift he ever did over his entire body was some type of bastardized, uh, explosive half range partial. His favorite lifts were like ugly bent rows where he's at like barely bending over using his whole body. He would do like quarter box squats. He would do a uh, high rows that were basically like explosive high pulls and he would bench through a limited mid range of motion. Philip, Philip looked like an IFBB pro. Now, of course you say, well, it's genetics. That's a catch all. It's genetics It's steroids, whatever it is, but it's at least verifiable that there is some application to this in a way that, uh, that is at least productive. Now, the question of how productive it is, I don't think anybody knows that. I don't think there's any amount of research that is so conclusive. You could say, pick one over the other, dismiss these other things. And um, I think people that pick one because they think that's going to give them the permanent edge, I think it's a bit short-sighted. But again, we're talking in the context of optimizing. So and I would argue versus the picking one and the other. So another point, a deadlift with an eccentric versus a deadlift without an eccentric. Which one would you pick? Would you not pick the one if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy and have an optimal right. approach to hypertrophy? Uh, yeah, probably with an eccentric. Why? Uh, because it's been long observed that if you are uh, under tension longer, demonstrating more control, more disadvantage, uh, that's, that's been a truism in lifting for a long time. I mean, uh, when you're blasting past stick points, you have momentum at every inch of the movement. So... If uh, you actually have to be under control at parts of the movement where you're typically uh, only experiencing upward momentum, uh, there's a better developmental effect. It's the same reason why I do uh, uh, halting deadlifts at my knees to try to increase my mid-range because tension there creates a better uh, response. So it stands a reason hypertrophy would be higher there as well. But, but wouldn't it be because of the amount of scientific evidence we have showing that, hey, the eccentric actually leads to more hypertrophy than just the concentric? I mean, that that helps, but that's kind of the trend of of where it does converge. It's on things that people know for a very long time. Um, I've I've never come across any studies about that. That's not denying that that they're there, that they're thorough. But that's something that's been known for like a very long time. Yeah. Anyways, my point, my point is that if we're if we're talking about optimizing and we uh -huh. are and let's say we had a bet between us, we had two athletes, twins, who's going to get which one bigger? I assume that a lot of the things you do would borrow from exercise science uh, so that you make sure that you do absolutely everything in your in your ability to maximize outcomes, even if that's an educated bet and in reality it may not offer as much as you as you hope. Well, let me let me put it this way. Like, I think when you look at an individual study and you control this one variable and you have people go on. I think there is a point in your training where that variable stops being the thing that's potentially holding you back or costing you gains. It could very well be some other variable that you've ignored or haven't considered. You grow quickly from things you're not sensitive to. So as you become very, very adapted to training in a very deep range of motion, is there no reason to think that the increase in tonnage uh, would have any effect to a very, very resistant lifter who's been doing Olympic squats his whole life? Take an Olympic lifter and have them do bodybuilding work like uh, any of your favorite bodybuilders do. Is there reason to believe their quads wouldn't experience new growth? The thing that's not being taken into account here is repeated bout. It is the fact that you do adapt to these things, you become resistant. So I find it, uh, I just find it short-sighted. So I would actually ask you, if you were, if, if you had triplets and you were told, hey, uh, you have to get each one of these jacked as possible, but you have to do three different things, you know, triplet A, um, is going to uh, do nothing but full range of motion or even lengthen partials. He'll do, uh, he'll take a note from Milo's book, just lengthen partials. The other one is just going to do, I don't know, mid range partials. Or number three, you can mix and match how you want. Where, what would you, what would you put your money on if you were going to bet what's optimal? 
and and uh, and please where you can cite the literature that informs that decision okay um trip uh, i'll i'll let i'll let milo respond to that even even more the triple triplet two is getting a slap on the head and is uh instantly <laughs> removed from from my will from for the mid to short uh partials uh but my i mean with the third triplet you didn't we didn't really define the specifics you said mix and match but we would have to have like full range well, of sure. motion plus length and partials whatever and we'd have to, we'd have to talk about what exercises how often they're doing what order they're doing the different ranges of motion in it would so, uh, let me put it this way it would definitely not be triple two triple two would be out of the picture for sure no money on triple two and depending on the specifics it would either be triple one or triple three citing uh wolf et al 2022 okay. uh, meta-analysis but that's 2023 chief 2023, of course, just checking East. whether he remembers. Um, <laughs> but you, you asked yeah, me Yeah, look, question. let me, yeah, sorry, hey, range of motion's my stuff. So, go, go, go. you know, the only reason I wouldn't bet a dime on triplet two is because of the evidence. Like, as far as practices go, there are comfortably dozens and dozens of very successful bodybuilders that never got a full stretch. They did essentially shortened partials. Were they successful? Yes. Does that mean I will yield uncritically to their practices as to my own? No. I'll look at what the evidence says because ultimately when it comes to certain less influential variables, it allows us to actually detect differences that are otherwise super easily overshadowed by A, us just looking at physiques as a means of measurement in practice, and B, to much more influential variables that comfortably overshadow their impact. And so that's where, you know, that's why I wouldn't bet anything on triplet two and would probably bet most of my money on triplets that was doing uh, only length and partials. But there is some degree of inference there. But that inference applies to anecdotes as well. Like, just because something worked for someone else doesn't mean it will work for you in practice, especially with the uh, greater and superior amount of confounders involved. So that's why I would bet on triplet doing length and partials in this case. And that's what I forgot. To reply to the question about the, not the question, the point about the Olympic weightlifter and squats and them getting their legs to explode. Yes, by adding leg extensions or sissy squats and allowing them to develop their rectus femoris more based on the scientific evidence. Yes, I would expect, again, based on the scientific evidence, that the addition of uh, quad isolation work uh, would allow them to get a bit more quad hypertrophy out of their program versus just the ATG squats that they've been doing, unless they've been doing much. But again, yeah, no, but it's, I, it's the science. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, modifying their squats so they don't squat as deep to where they can now handle, let's say, 15 to 20 percent more weight uh, and they can maintain tension on the muscle like so many bodybuilders like to do without relying on uh, mechanical tension to support them at the bottom or uh, or uh, standing all the way up. Yeah, you, you would find uh, you don't think there's a use case. You'd find no no benefit for somebody that was very desensitized or un, uh, not or sorry, very sensitive to that stimulus. You, you um, wouldn't expect any, any yes. new growth. We're yes, we're, we're we're moderating we're you, good. Omar. Now, uh, so I'm going to moderate this just because uh, I think this is it's interesting, but I think we're deviating away from maybe some of the central conversations, which is crazy. There were almost at two hours. This has been very interesting. But I think there's two fundamental points, like two fundamental points of conversation, maybe to actually get into. Um, and, and it will deal with what we've been discussing before. But the first one is actually what you said, Alex. I want to hear from all parties here what they feel to be some of the biggest limiting factors in our space right now. In other words, what is truly preventing individuals from making gains? Because the title of the video is Why Exercise Science is Killing Your Gains, right? So that's that, that's an interesting, bold claim. Um and I'm just curious also, I think when uh, you talk, uh, Alex, or maybe even like a pack of mile, they uh, talk with researchers and, and so on and so forth. And they talk against like PubMed warriors is that we have to be always acutely aware of the audience where I would put forth. And I don't know if you'd agree, Alex, it's just, it's just me now on the outside. So in our age cohort and who we're talking to, like some of these conversations, like it's an insular conversation that's uh, important, but in the meta greater space, what I see those TikTok kids, and in terms of like, I'm joking, but in terms of what's followed or why it's being followed, 
I see uh, many, many, many other issues. You just brought up as an example, the Mike Menser kind of trend. I'm like, where did that come from? Why did that even reemerge in the first place? Where it's more like a cultural phenomenon where people want to identify with the person and with their values, as opposed to this is what's going to get me the results. And that to me, just as an outsider, I want to hear everyone what they're saying. Um, I see, and I, I look at magnitude of effect, right? Like in terms of, okay, this person's getting a million views. Like Alex, you did a very good job of getting a topic to get almost 200,000 views. But before that, nobody wants to talk about. It. So that's like kudos to you in terms of shaping a, a very compelling video essay. And that's why we're here, man. So it's nothing but respect. But I'm saying in terms of actual impact in our space, and if we take a look at the entire fitness industry, so forget like our own personal interests, like all four of us, you know what I mean? Like we're, we all kind of, we converge to use that word in similar interests, but there's that greater fitness space. Do we not also think that over time, what's happened, and I'd say one of maybe the functions and Pack and Milo could talk about this, of science is to disconfirm that we're almost, we have a, an abundance now of information of things that do not work, meaning that over a decade ago, and there's a point I'm coming to, and I want to hear what you think are the big rocks then preventing people. Um, over a decade ago, there's those huge debates in terms of calories, like whether or not the validity of macronutrients, whether or not you need to count calories, what is the thing, what is the impetus that causes someone to lose weight? And there's all these, you know, heavy handed beliefs, these core beliefs, uh, anecdotal passed over time through coaches, gurus, and so on and so forth. They basically got obliterated as a result of a lot of the research. And now we're like in a 2024 uh, scenario here where a lot of, I would say, the big rocks that were just used by marketers when you talk about incentive structures, magazines, and so on and so forth, that allowed, essentially, I'm going to say it, a lot of bullshit to remain relevant and for people then to believe it as truisms have now been kind of eroded. And there are people then, the, the interest then is trying to get the information correct. Now, there's a, a couple different ways that people pursue that or what they think is the best path towards it. But I do think 2024 versus let's say 2014, um, it is as a result of scrutinizing some of these fundamental concepts, testing them, that we now arrive at a place where I think we're having this conversation. And I do wonder just amongst the four of us here, what we really feel are the major limiting factors preventing the average listener, and we'd have to define who our population is, preventing them from gains. And that's an interesting question that I would need to think about. But when I take a look, Alex, I would just say broadly, once again, kudos to you with the video at the greater space. And what you said, Mike Menser, I could cite like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call anyone else out, but uh call them. I, I see some big problems, man, is what I'm saying. So I, maybe I want to hear from you, the Milo pack, because then I think the the last portion of the conversation would be talking then about exercise science, what's its intended function, and then what can its utility be for the audience. But I want to hear what do we think the actual big problem is because the title was Exercise Science is Killing Your Gains. Again, part of it's the title, like I, I watched your video uh, to get people to click, but go ahead, man. Uh, is this to me? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. First okay. So first of all, I have to address the, the clickbait because as I got better at navigating YouTube, uh, I got a lot of feedback about my choice of thumbnails and titles that not everybody is in love with. But um, I actually used that title because there were some people that were outright offended at another, this is killing your gains title. That was straight up tongue in cheek because Athlean X puts out the killing your gains title. So that was, anyways, I think that went over some people's head and it just looked like I was actually trying to replicate that, uh, the success of that very incendiary thumbnail. But um, yes, I'm, I'm getting better at clickbait and hopefully I can use those powers for good to actually give people substance and subvert their expectations that, oh, there's something meaningful here. So um, anyways, as far as what is holding the average lifter back, that is a hard thing because you have to evaluate uh, stuff with the individual, um, things that don't have anything to do with the actual prescription of the workout that I think there are massive things that the individual can take accountability for that they don't often. Um, and then you do have to look at the prescriptions, where they're getting their information, how they go about putting it into practice, uh, how they're learning and evolving with their program as they go on. Part of it is having direction. Here's something I don't even know. Like I've kicked this idea around. If you want somebody to be the biggest hoss they can be, is it better to glue them to a system that's proven and just have them do that on end and learn it to milk it for everything it's worth? Or is it better to have people go through different phases through their, their life where they try different things? I don't even have an answer to that. I don't have any way to grapple with it. There's schools of thought that kick people off with starting strength where they do three or four barbell exercises. And it's the progression with pretty good stimulating lifts that gets growth uh, to a pretty sufficient degree. 
And you could say that, okay, it's simple and it works well. So psychologically, that's a, a win for a lot of people. It's motivating for a lot, a lot of people to see the weight go up every week. It gives them technical expertise. But you could also say it doesn't teach them a damn thing about handling complexity in a workout. On the other hand, you have basically what they do with youth athletes, which is you have them start out uh, doing everything under the sun, you know, play as a developmental tool to be well-rounded, to grow every little bit of uh, muscle, to learn different movement patterns, unilateral work like lunges, body weight stuff, um, dumbbells, machines, and so on. What's best? Couldn't, couldn't tell you. And I don't think anybody else has a lot of insight into that either. The superpower is that the average lifter starts out as, as a novice, grows from just about everything because we sit indoors. So our baseline is very, very low from where it should be. So we're super sensitive to any stimulus. Um, and the good news is, is that whatever you get into, uh, it's just a matter of application and showing up. And even if you get stuck and you hit those walls, which everybody does, there is a way over it. You just have to believe that there is, and it's going to come from paying attention and engaging more and being present. I would be inclined to say most of it. If we're talking about the average lifter, again, there's a value judgment, about, but I'm talking about the type of person who probably wants to be bigger, probably wants to be leaner, but in very real terms, doesn't have the pain tolerance that some people do, or doesn't have the willingness to forego other things in their life. That's a real thing. Um, I know the most competitive people and uh, you know, they're off, <laughs> they're off and it's, it's, uh, you know, the thing that leads to success. I had an interesting discussion with Sam Sheether, who's very, very smart dude, uh, just hit a 600 pound bench. Uh, his brother hit like a 2000 pound total at like 19. Um, and he's very involved in the raw powerlifting or the natty powerlifting community. Oh my God. Sorry. My dog is losing it. Um, but he was talking about how heavy handed approaches work very well. That's another confounding factor to what degree is just being durable something that can can keep you in one piece. If you apply heavy handed approaches and people survive, they get pretty strong pretty quick. So I really think it's people learning how to work hard. Uh, I think it's uh, consistency, not what you think consistency is, but holding yourself to a high standard to know if the people you're following are doing this because they're motivated to, as far as showing up, doing what they're supposed to do, not skipping out on their work, expecting themselves to work harder as time goes on. And if they're taking notes that continued progress is all but guaranteed. And it's usually when they don't do one of those things that they stall out. Again, to whatever degree it's optimal, the optimal thing is to have some way of growing continuously on autopilot without um, continuously having to jump around and try different things. So uh, so that would be on an individual, like case by case basis, how they're actually applying themselves or training. As far as actual information, the same things that have been around forever, getting distracted by things they think are it, getting sucked into cult of personality, uh, I do think, and I know this is the crux of this argument, I do think there's a person that's attracted to science as a marketing tool, and they apply a very unthorough, low resolution view of what science is. And I do think that has uh, effects on how they put the answer out there in something that's optimal, as opposed to putting it on them to figure it out. Uh, and then like you know, program hopping is a big one. It's, it's not doing anything consistently enough to grow, not applying yourself to the program to learn how to milk it for all it's worth. I really think that's probably what holds most people back. Yeah. Mauro, you changed the mood lighting. You've been silent. Uh, you've just been putting out the vibes. Let's hear, let's hear from you because I do think that, um, that is the kernel that got people to click. And then you went over Alex, like uh, your video, your point, And I do think you're very thorough with your argument. And that is perhaps what people, I think that's the thing that people identify with currently, because personally, what I've observed, especially on social media, I, I do see a pushback. I call it not an anti-intellectual movement, but just like, oh, these science bros are lame. And then they listen to you and they go, ah, okay. So if we want to answer the question of the title of the video, then what do you think uh, Milo is? Like, what are some of the biggest limiting factors for your average lifter that is, you know, desiring to make progress? For sure. So for the average lifter, I think it has next to nothing to do with this conversation. And that is consistency. Uh, I think the average lifter who goes to the gym goes for like six months and then stops lifting and then repeats the cycle, stops lifting for two years, goes back to the gym, does it again. So not really relevant to the conversation, I'd say. But to answer the question of is exercise science killing your gains, I think it isn't. Um, I think the vast majority of exercise science content on YouTube is at least getting you to hit the big rocks. Is there going to be some misinterpretation in there? Absolutely. Not everyone has a PhD, and even PhDs like myself often make mistakes in interpretation. That's just how it is. Um, but equally, interpretations are rarely so egregious that they lead to you completely missing the big rocks. 
So I think the statement, and I don't think Alex claims this, by the way, I think it's just clickbait ultimately, but the statement that exercise science is killing your gains is just not true in my view. Um, so yeah, that's the, the boring answer. I think that broadly speaking, if I had to pinpoint one issue being more prevalent than another, I would say the issue of cults of personality and relying excessively on anecdotes and on someone's credentials, i.e. their physique and their previous success in a given sport is probably more of an issue than relying on science. Because again, practices in at high level, in high level bodybuilding, high level powerlifting, I would say are more heterogeneous than the big rocks that evidence-based information typically provides. And I think broadly speaking, I see more of an issue with just blindly following what high level athletes are doing versus, or even just not even high level, like there's plenty of Jack TikTok influencers and Instagram influencers that aren't high level athletes or anything, but they're just jacked enough to impress the common folk and people will take what they do as gospel. And I think that's much more of an issue than uh, the potential occasional misinterpretation of science, because I think it ultimately the vast majority of the time still leads people to a pretty reasonable place with the big rocks in place. Pack. Yeah. So echoing Milo, all, everything that he said, like, yeah, the, the average individual who is not, who's for sure not watching this, uh, especially at this stage, if you're watching code 640 to claim your hundred dollar barbell, I don't remember your company name. Alex will send you a hundred dollar voucher, which Omar will pay. Um, but joking, I said, yeah, the average individual just needs to stay consistent and, and take the, uh, the main boxes. I think what's affecting people negatively is the poor interpretation of science and worrying about the details and forgetting the big boxes. Because I do think that even if you're too concerned with the details, if you're still taking the boxes, you can be as concerned as you like about whether your tempo was optimal or not. You're not going to not make gains. And that's why I asked, like, I posed the question of who's really putting out their uh, content that is pushing away from the from the, the big boxes. Like, you watch Jeff Nippard, you watch other evidence-based channels, and sure, you may go and try this new technique or uh, try resting a bit less or a bit more or this exercise or that exercise. But at the end of the video, you're still being told to lift hard, add weight over time, train hard uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so just for, for whoever is listening, remember that it's the totality of evidence that, that, that we're looking at. Factor your personal preference and you're on your way to make gains. Science is your friend. Make sure you're listening to the consensus of the scientific community because there will always be the Joel Seedmans and the whatevers and bias in science. If 25 scientists that are also coaches and athletes are saying, you know what, if you want to maximize gains, potentially do this, then that's probably a good idea. And keep in mind that optimal, chasing optimal um, should be viewed more as a, as, a, as a fun journey rather than that one specific variable that will definitely get you the optimal gains. Look at everyone now being unified. We had a beautiful moment that all of a branch. Damn it, Omar. Extended once again. Look, we got, we got to bring it because there, there is way bigger shit going on. Okay. And what you said, How we dare said you. Mike Mentor, when you said that Mike, How Mentor, I was like, I know exactly you. what you mean. <laughs> uh, but w what I want to say, because I'm, I'm down to go for like a, at least 20 more minutes. I do think there's one final part of this conversation. <laughs> um, but what I will say, it's interesting to me, Pax, like I'm done with this, is that uh, uh, what's interesting to me and must be noted, and this is once again, being an outsider, not being a researcher like uh, Pac and Milo, but now having visited like so UK, like Solent, uh, going to Texas Tech, is one thing I do want to note for the viewers or listeners. It's simply that most researchers, researchers just like us right here, are extremely passionate about what they do. And so we talk about all these incentives and these structures and like something like bias or uh, so on and so forth. It's like these folks aren't getting paid a lot um, in terms of the grants that they're given compared to other, you know, uh, uh, places inside the universities or colleges. They're not very high. A lot of them, like when I went to Texas Tech and like, so Madison and like Christian, the two PhD students are doing it, they came in on off thing. This wasn't a thing like they had to do in order to complete their program. It is by and large, uh, by the passion that they have, that a lot of these things move forward. So I do just want to give a respect to all the people putting in the time and effort. Shout out as example on Iron Culture, we have Kai Homer, 
He doesn't get paid. Okay, we're terrible. Okay, we're anti. We're we're pure capitalists there. But he does. He does the timestamps and stuff because he's about once again the culture. So I think we're all united in being enthusiasts. And I think one of the things that I did respect Alex with your video is one of the common criticisms of like let's say those that are science adjacent um, would be you know some of the tropes like oh they well they don't train hard like they're they're like pencil next to this and that and that's not obviously the route you took at all but it is funny that once again like i think jeff just because he has a large channel he'd be catching strays sometime where they'll be like i'm not going to name that person a certain person that sounds like a parrot that said years ago jeff doesn't train hard meanwhile jeff is a natural bodybuilding champion in canada like my country he is a former national powerlifting champion you know what i mean like he's like he's at the highest of the highest level and so you just have these reckless things being said so all that to say, very, very positive. Let's maybe distill it back, though, and let's get a little inflammatory and just say, so let's perhaps answer the question of what is the intended function of exercise science and what's its utility for, let's say, we're talking now the consumer or the average listener. Like, what is it supposed to be? And is there some sort of chasm, what you're saying, Alex, between what's going on, how it's being communicated, and then how it's being interpreted? So there is an issue potentially of, you know, once again, you said like the replication, like, so, like some of those things, but to me, it seems more like it's kind of the middle ground, like some of the, the communication. And then also maybe because of some of the marketing, how it's interpreted by the consumer. Can we like bring it now to the, the central point? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. And all of those are all, all kind of peripheral because I mean, even at the, at the center of my argument, there's this real concern over if you grant all of the, the things you want to do it the best way possible, uh, can you even get there? Uh, in a way, in a way, I think that people imagine that you probably can, which uh, is what makes this worthwhile. Um, and that that's that's really the shortcoming. It's really um, I I believe that the thing that keeps people from being the strongest, most game day ready version of themselves, whatever people people talk about genetic ceiling, nobody's ever experienced it. But uh, if you actually are to get there. Um, I'm, I have so many questions about what each step along the way has to look like and how do you predict when that step is appropriate? Uh, I feel like there's just, um, too many confounding variables to get to this level of predictability that you want, at least that would outpace, uh, what people do by themselves. So when I'm trying to think about what the role is, I feel like there's potentially good work that could be done. Like I would imagine, I would imagine if you could collect data the way Google does and you could crunch data from. I feel like there should be just a massive program to just pull data from every lifting app that's ever existed. And you would have a potentially a lot of good data that you could make some sense of. There's probably insights that you could have. And I'm not, here's the thing. I'm not even, um, I come off, I think as being more uh, cynical and assholeish than I actually feel because it really is only when I think the field is overreaching that there's a problem. Uh, I feel like there are probably things that are going to be, uh, confirmed and maybe it'll take time, but there probably are things that are, that we're going to converge on at least little bits that can uh, be settled debates that still rage on unnecessarily. Uh, and I think that can absolutely happen. What role it has with the individual. I can't even begin to, to say that because I have a lot of issues with the ways the questions get asked and presented. Um, I, uh, I think it's the same as everything else. It's, it's don't turn away from information but hold yourself highly accountable to be able to interpret it the best possible way. Ideally, we would have a very rigid system of uh, instructors with a hierarchy where you would know how to get these questions answered or have them laid out. Uh, I think it's rare that we get a panel like this that's kind of really thorough and digs deep into it, which I think is really cool. Um, but yeah, in the midst of all of that chaos and unanswered questions and uncertainty and people trying to capture attention, it's, it's just uh, be vigilant do the best you can and don't take any piece of information for granted, whether it is uh, anecdotal because you heard it from the buff guy at the 24 hour fitness, or if it does come out of a single piece of research that somebody somewhere is going to be holding up is like, Oh, well, this is the thing you're training needs to revolve around. Sure. Who wants to go first? Pack. I see uh, you pointing. Oh yeah. Come on. Pack, go ahead, uh, bro. Bring it in. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> Again, be an evidence-based, have an ev a truly evidence-based practice, understand the limitations of science, 
understand the TNCs that come with a lot of studies, look at the totality of available evidence and the strength of that evidence, because just because we have a meta-analysis on something, that meta-analysis is made of other studies. Listen to people, listen to the scientific consensus, value practical experience, especially in areas where we don't have science, for example, accessories for your power lifts, power lifting peaking methods, although we have some science of that. And at the same time, remember that you must be open-minded and ready to change your mind in light of new evidence, but don't turn away from the science because, you know, some people abuse it. Don't turn away from practice because some, some people abuse it. Use a combination of both and you will be solid, especially if you're trying to optimize adaptations. As exercise scientists, we need to do better. Uh, we have things that we we are actively uh, trying to promote like open science being transparent with methods open data um, using statisticians actual statisticians as we've done in most of our projects in the, the past three years uh, versus doing the stats ourselves um, in order to have a more appropriate sort of uh, analysis of the data uh, and at the same time transparency is key for exercise science so there's obviously what the, the listener takes away but also what we need to do in order to improve and from the practitioner side of things there's no need to create this sort of uh, a straw man monster of the the science-based lifter who disregards the, the experience in the trenches uh, we should all collaborate with each other draw from expert opinion draw from those experiences draw from scientific evidence and <clears throat> legalize it come on throw that message in there it's finally time 420 blaze it free the guys milo Back to you, my brother. I mean, not to just echo what Pac just said, including legalization, of course. Um, I mean, it ultimately comes down to scientific literacy. If you think you have good scientific literacy, feel free to read papers and be slow to change your mind is the main thing. If you already have the big rocks in place, just because one study comes out, if there's already a relatively well-established body of evidence, don't just change all of your training practices at once. This is one thing I see quote-unquote science-based lifters do sometimes, which is to be very quick to change their whole practices because one study came out. Ultimately, with relatively small sample sizes in sports science, you do need to be cautious and gradual and a late adopter when it comes to some new findings. Equally, if you don't have the scientific literacy, which I think applies to most people uh, when it comes to sports science findings, I would recommend following a multitude of of relatively well-respected sports scientists and seeing what they seemingly agree upon for the most part. I think that will give you a comparable understanding of the evidence as opposed to trying to haphazardly make your way through the evidence yourself. Ultimately, I think for a lot of people, that is going to be a better approach than to try and interpret and stay up to date themselves. Equally, there are going to be things, like Pac said, not to reiterate exactly what he said, where we don't have evidence, we don't have much evidence, or it's difficult or impossible to get evidence. Like, for example, one thing we don't have a lot of evidence directly looking at is, does getting bigger directly make you stronger? That's difficult to really assess experimentally. However, you can draw certain inferences from practice as well, but just make sure that with your worldview and whether you think scientific evidence is more informative when it comes to your practices or whether you think other people's practices are more informative to your own practices, just make sure that you draw on some sort of information source. I think for Pac and I, speaking for him now, that is going to be the evidence base. Um, and I think that where possible, you should refer to the evidence base over anecdote. But I think that a combination thereof is going to be best. And when you don't have evidence, anecdotes will be your second best bet. Did we just do it? Nope. Just, I no. now disagree I, with Milo. I, I, I'm with <laughs> Alex. Fuck you, Milo. <laughs> no, I'm the, the Sorry, I had shifted. to. I had to. I think, I think the one way to really uh, bring this all together would be eventually, because we all actually like to lift, is get a lifting session in. Ooh. That would be awesome. Imagine, though, we show up and we were, like, much smaller, much weaker, and, like, uh, with goniometers measuring everything. <laughs> Alex has a wig for some reason. I, yeah. My body, my body fat is exactly as high as it looks, so I don't think I'm subverting anybody's expectation. No, I'm I'm the old husband. I don't even lift, bro. Uh, pack is, like, me 
uh, when I was all bright eyed and full of wonder and coming up in my uh, <laughs> my lifting career. I'm the I'm the look closely. This is where nah. it's headed. If you're not careful, uh, nah. red cheeks and all. <laughs> no. I will say, I, I think it's great that all of us are unified in our desire to better the community, right, further it along. And that is, was the impetus, uh, Alex, behind your video and why we got on for this chat. So I just want to say I appreciate everyone for being so civil, for enduring. Honestly, it's like a, a two hour and 20 minute chat. Don't know how we're going to chop it up. But I think there's a lot of insight there. Uh, I am curious what people think, like when they made it to Pax Point, where it's like at the hour 50 mark, he said, like, comment down below. Um, but these are these are necessary steps, and I like that we're having just conversations in general uh, in the space. So I, I want to say first, thank you for inviting me, and also uh, thank you to the three of you for participating. It was awesome, and thank you, Alex. Uh, yeah, I had, a, the, I had a great time. Yeah, th thank you for doing this, guys. I'm happy we did this. It was great to see that you were open to to doing this so quickly, and this was, I think, very insightful for for both ends. And we look to we look forward to training with you on Sunday. And absolutely, hugging. come. Come down to Texas. I might, I might have to change my plans in March. I might have to leave my wife with the new newborn and head up to Ohio. <laughs> it's my favorite place in the world, Ohio. You're coming all the way to the United States. Like, that's that's the place you're checking out. Lucky. Oh, yep. you told you told them about. Uh, you told. Uh, I, I told them. Yeah. yeah let's go. But this is be this is between us. Oh, uh, this yes. this can't say publicly. But, <laughs> He's got to uh, hit the record button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, so I, I forgot to ask. That, that's a secret. Yeah. That is a secret. We'll leave okay. you at this, at that. Let's just flex and say goodbye, and we can have the chit chat. Much respect. Peace. Peace. And then you guys can. <sighs>